going to be here just talking about game development, game programming. I think we'll be going over some code and talking about a couple other interesting things. I've got something cool and interesting that I wanted to show Jason that I've been holding off on for the last few minutes so that I wouldn't spoil it before the stream. And um, anyway, thanks to everybody for coming out. I just want to say that first. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and share and all that stuff. And thanks, Jason, for being here. Um, hello and say hello in chat, everyone. What's up, man? Hey, yeah, it's good, good. Don't mind me. I'm, I'm, I'm being a good boy and getting some programming done. I, this is my end of my work day before we start the other code we're going to write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, like I was saying earlier, I, I haven't been able to do a whole lot of programming this week, so kind of excited at the idea of maybe writing a little bit of code here and doing something live, putting together a little bit of a, a an application or project or something or game or something. But first, I just wanted to catch up with everybody in chat, say hello, um, see what kinds of questions and other things we might have. If anybody's got any interesting game development questions that they want to present, something that they're stuck on, struggling with, or just think is interesting, or something that's popped up in the news they're curious about, um, let us know. Just drop a question in chat, and we'll possibly just pop that right up on screen and go over it. But I think I wanted to start by just kind of pulling out the thing that I've been holding off on. Are, are you ready for it? I'm, I'm ready. Go for it. <laughs> All, right. All right. Here we go. So it's... Oh, there it is. This thing. Have you seen this? I have not. It says dev kit. I'm already excited. I love dev kit. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> just showed up this morning. So it came... Um, came this morning kind of gave me the idea for the title too of this thing i was like oh i want to talk about it a little bit it's um well here let me let me pull down the other one real quick oh wow more than one interesting well it's something related so i you've you've seen this and you know what this is oh yes yes, yes. okay so this is the emotive epoch headset that you e pop e on yeah. um if, yeah. if your head isn't as big as mine you pop it on your head like this and it like reads your brain and controls stuff. It's extremely painful if you have a giant head like me, though. So um, it's good for. I, I've actually coded for those before, so they're pretty cool. Yeah, they're they're fun to play with. They are a blast to play with, but it, it gives me a headache. So I, I really, <laughs> really struggled to play with it. Like I, I had so much fun with it, but I'd play with it for like half an hour, and then I'd have a headache. This thing apparently is um, same kind of tech, or does uh, solving the same kind of problem which is reading your brain waves and using that to basically be a controller or an input system to do, to do stuff. And I've seen the video of it. They have like the a little package sort of alludes that it's like, is that razor or something? Cause that looks like razor packaging. It's, it's not, but it does kind of look similar, doesn't it? And especially with my chair right here, but like <laughs> go side by side. No, but it's, um, I think it was, uh, it's a company in France. Uh, it says made in France, but I saw they've got a, really interesting video where they've got it kind of like attached to the back of vr headsets this is the way that it sets up it goes onto your neck and then it um straps on i haven't opened it up yet i'm going to talk to them before i open it up and say anything really in detail about it and i want to have a you know a lot of experimentation time with it but it seemed really cool and interesting and i honestly just wanted to kind of show it to you share it with you and see what kind of ideas you've got and what kind of idea the other people have because i had a lot of ideas for this thing mm. Um, they just didn't work because they gave me a headache and I couldn't wear this with a VR headset. That's that's and, what I was going to say. That's one thing okay. that, that interests me the most is that the problem with those is they tend to have to have surface area that touches your forehead. Yeah, they're and right so, here and the headset's like right up to here. So it would never work. I got it. I remember I got this thing and I was like, oh yeah, I'm trying to I put it on. And I was like, wait a minute. My headset's not going to fit, is it? I put my headset on. Not even close. <sighs> my dreams were ruined. <laughs> Yeah, so I'd be curious then to see how it works with, um, you know, properly set up with the headset. Because I, I'd be honest, I have my doubts because of the way the technology works. Like normally it is literally about the number of sensors and how much surface area to your skin they have. Mm -hmm. So if it can work without actually that, I'm very curious how that happens. Yeah, I'm curious too. I just figure like it's been a long time since I got that one. Hopefully the tech has just gotten so much better that I can just strap a thing onto my neck and get a, a really cool effect. So I think it'll be... Uh, at the very least, it's going to be a blast to code with, right? to try to come up with a, a cool project and some ideas um, that, that I could do with it. I don't know if you happen to have any ideas, by the way. so Or if anybody in chat happens to have any ideas, let me know because I'd be kind of curious. 
Well, well, the first thing I almost always do with those is because so for people who aren't familiar, the the way the way the technology of that basically works is so you can't really read someone's mind. That's just not something we have the technology to do yet. But what you can do is you can basically read EEG data or EKG data, whichever version. There's, there's lots of variants of whatever data you're looking for. But long story short, you end up with waves. You end up with brainwave patterns that will, you know, show you someone's brain. Um, and what you do is you combine that. You, you, you effectively, you take that brainwave information and you uh, scan it over time and you get a baseline. And so if you're thinking about one thing, for like you like focused heavily on something and then you stop focusing on it your brain waves will peak and drop you know kind of like volume levels so what they tend to do is it's pattern matching same way you can have voice recognition that's actually just pattern matching sound you can do proper voice recognition but you can also just do one which is say the word five times get a rough pattern match it every time so uh, a lot of these out of the box even if you don't do much fanciness with it um you can effectively say this thought represents left this thought represents right up down give yourself four things to focus on and then you could just control a box and send that motion as like whenever this event fires it's just an event system then at that stage um it's pretty hard for you as a user because you have to train yourself to focus which is kind of cool that's that's why there's so many star wars toys that have like the ball move and stuff relative to it it's the same technology it's just using it as the excuse of focus on one thing so that the ekg levels change but again, there's so much cool stuff you can do with that as as an interesting way of having focus be a controller for something. Yeah, I, I just got to come up with a couple that would be fun. Like, oh I've, yeah, yeah. I've e used e it e EG is of... the brain. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm 100 percent wrong. EKG is hard. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm getting. Yeah, there you go. I saw yeah. that in chat there too. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, the the input and movement stuff is like my default too. That's the first thing that I wanted to do with it. Or the, the first project I wanted to do was like a hang glider that you could just control with your mind. So you just have like a brain controlled hang glider for people that couldn't move. Like if you couldn't, if you're paralyzed or something, can move and go like fly around and look at stuff. That'd be kind of neat. Um, probably not very useful, but kind of neat. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't need to come up with something else that would be like a fun, interesting project with it. I got to, I don't know. You got any other ideas outside of movement? Like, you know, I know, you know like, what I do? Things, but concentrating on stuff is kind of hard. Go ahead. I would tie it to, uh, you know, you know that um, plug-in Kronos, the one from Ludig for time control? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, imagine doing that and having, like, thoughts for slow and slow time and, like, rewind time and have to, like, focus and have some game where a character is running along and, like, autom say sort of an automatic runner. But you can't control the character, but stuff is like dropping in things that make either platforms or can hurt them. And you have to sort of think to slow or stop time to control what's happening to them so they don't get hit or they, you know, platforms land or freeze at the right time or something. That could be cool. Yeah, that'd be an interesting idea. You just had to think two, really two thoughts. Um, yeah. You, know what's you, you, you could have maybe speed up, slow down and then freeze or something and then try to, you know. Yeah, that could be interesting. There's a couple ideas in chat too. Some about um, color and shape matching, or controlling transforms, or um, even Pong. I, w I wonder how Pong would work. Like, I wonder if you could do like a Pong where you could concentrate on like going going up. You know, actually control the the paddle, like with thinking about it, go up, go down, like to a degree where you're. It's moving to where you're looking. I'm pretty sure that had, the one you have, I think one of their demo projects is Pong. At least it used to be back in their code project ones. It's been quite a while. I remember the one that I remember the most from the this one, the uh, emotive, the Epoch one. I think that's what this one was, was the um, like RPG wood chopping one. I think that one was actually in Unity. You could get in Unity and play it. And my kid was the only one that could do it. I could not beat it. Probably again, his head fit in the thing, right? But mm. he would, uh, he was able to go chop down the wood and cross the bridge and all the other stuff that I couldn't do. I, I get past like the first step. And that's it. So I'm, yeah, really, really curious to see how this new one works, especially since it's you know, not head, spe head size specific. <laughs> Anyway, so yeah, how, does, how does this one sit actually? Because I, I look at it's hard to because again, it it, does, it doesn't show the different um, the connection points. So I'm just curious, like what's the how does that one actually work? I haven't actually opened it. I don't know. I guess I just so, so about the packaging almost looks like it attaches to the back of your neck or something like that. It's hard to tell. It does yeah, it's got I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm gonna open it later though. <laughs> Let me pull up a video. 
Let me see if they got a video of it that shows it in action. Because it, it looks like it's going to take a little bit of work, and I don't want to mess the whole thing up there. Um, next. Find. Let me put the... Um, I'm going to just pull up the page so everybody can see it real quick. Oh, yeah. Did you see it on their page already, Jason? No, no, I haven't seen it at all. Okay. Let's see. Let's do a screen share real quick. Pull up our tab and take a peek. Oh, yeah. So this back of your head. There you can see it. See how they've got it kind of attached on yeah, the... That, um... that is definitely been designed to support VR headsets. That's like yeah. literally what it's been designed for. Yeah, they've got, I think here they show it actually strapped on to an Oculus. Or I'm not sure which headset that was. It was too quick. But yeah, you can see it, it looks looks interesting for sure. I don't know. I'm excited to try it out. I'll be doing yeah. it soon. <laughs> Do a whole video about it and talk about it. Um, let everybody know uh, how it actually ends up. Let me know if it's more rubbish I should buy. Because, you know, of course I will. <laughs> remote, if it's remotely fun, I'll buy it myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that. My my guess is that it'll be fun in um, aim, shoot, teleport. Okay. I will say though the last the last toy like this that I got properly was the the Mayo, and I was not impressed. So. Oh yeah. We'll we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm usually about fifty fifty on them, like whether or not I'm actually going to use it use a thing more than once. But this one seems pretty interesting, so should be cool. I'm I'm excited to try it out though and see um see what kind of stuff we can do with it. See what kind of stuff came up in uh chat. Oh, somebody liked your uh it looks like your idea of a time control game with a marble to just uh jump. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm, I I admit I I'm, I love time control anything. Like if anything's got anything to do with time control, it tends to be something I enjoy. Yeah. I'm kind of the same way. I I really like that speeding up and rewinding stuff. One thing I've always really wanted to do that is a completely ridiculous idea, but I would love to do is just make like an MMO where you could have a thing that rewinds time for a certain amount of time. I've always wanted to have that like in a game, have the architecture of the game actually be able to support it. I mean, it'd be the kind of thing you'd have to be prepared for long in advance and it's probably well, you, not nearly worth the time, but have you, have you heard of Archon? Um, let me check. I sure brought that up before. Um, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. What is this game? What, what so am I missing? It's uh, it's. Uh, make sure I get the name right. It's. I think it's spelling. Um, there, there is a game which I haven't played in a very long time, which is effectively an RTS with time travel as a core mechanic. Um, and it's kind of insane. You have told me about that one, yeah, yeah. Where you could yeah, send think, units yeah. back in time to help yourself. Yes, that that one, that one sounds interesting. Yeah, that's a it's a Akron, A C H R O N. Yeah. Um, the the thing, like I said, the thing that really interests me about that game isn't just that it's got time travel; it's that it's almost like you know when you make a, a simulation game and things start acting relative to the simulation, and so it starts acting like real life. Like for example, if you ever if you ever done um oiler integration stuff with um voids or whatever just the just the nature of applying the rules makes them act like fish or act like birds or whatever because that's what that is right it's just like moving applying the avoidance behaviors that animals would actually use when avoiding each other in the radius um if you get the numbers right it can look pretty realistic and so what really interested me is looking at this game where it's like you have things you can go back in time you can plan your strategies in time and so all of those fun paradoxes, like, you know, the grandfather paradox, only the time stuff, are not only proven in the game, but are actual strategies. Like, there are strategy guides for how to, like, apply certain known, like, written science fiction paradoxes so that you can get the most benefit out of your resources and stuff. It's crazy. It just, I love, that idea interests me so much about the fact that, like, well, if you want to grandfather paradox this, you can do this to get this, and you get these things. It's, it just makes it so much more interesting. I'm adding that to my list of notes for the week, so I can just go try it out. Because this is the second time you've told me about it, I feel like I need to play it. 
Yeah. I, I would say, honestly, I, it's probably old enough that it's going to be hard to really get into. But I think if you just watch the online guides, like how to play the game, there's like instructions on how to use certain time mechanics and paradoxes. Just watching someone explain how time travel works to like be able to build units that cost you nothing because you build it and then delete the factory before they're done. But make sure that you destroy the enemy base prior to doing that. And yeah, it's great. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. May I check out the videos first? It definitely sounds interesting, though. Seems unique. Yeah, I've always just liked that idea of being able to kind of like undo and rewind stuff. Just having mm. that, you know, as a pattern. I think it's probably like ever since I learned it as a pattern, I've been wanting to like, how can I do something like this in a game, in this kind of game? Like, how could? Because you see like rewinding in racing games all the time. It's like mm. the one place where you see rewinding consistently. Uh, they'll do that they'll rewind mechanic a lot of time um but well, well, Jonathan blow be- has this entire like i think it's like a two-hour gdc talk where he goes through how he implemented time and why there's like eight different problems and how he's actually got his game runs on two separate time steps one that's like the actual time steps and one that's sort of like the time correcting that goes by afterwards and sort of fixes any anomalies in time that have happened the second time around and there's a reason why it works that way with like a guaranteed time step separately from the other one and there's a lot of stuff he's done to resolve some of the issues with being able to scrub time you know oh, sorry i'm just wanting to pull it up real quick because i yeah it sounds like a familiar video but i don't remember it now yeah, it was I'm interesting. I, don't, I don't know when i saw it yeah we'll do it a little bit while ago but yeah it was jonathan blow talking about braid and time right. yeah i have to check it out sometime I'll go find it, find that interview. If anybody has a link to it, drop it in chat or that that talk. I, I'd love to check it out sometime. I don't think I've seen it. It sounds good, though. Sounds like something I should definitely watch. <laughs> anyway, let's see. We got any other questions in here? Things popping up? Somebody asked if we could get more Jasons. I think it's possible. <laughs> Jason asked. <laughs> Gotta love it. Um. Yeah, anyway, so one of the things I I had mentioned earlier was that I kind of wanted to just maybe do a little bit of coding. So if we we don't end up with, we don't have a lot of questions, maybe we just jump in and make something, just build a little game, do it live collaboratively and make something simple and fun. Um, I didn't have any real specific ideas. I mean, I came up with a couple terrible ones earlier today, but I don't have anything great. So I don't know if anybody in chat has ideas that they want to just toss around real quick of things that might be interesting to put together or see just kind of put together like as a team um or if you had anything jason like um nothing comes to mind I mean, the other thing too is maybe there's is there like certain systems or, or patterns or mechanics or something that people want more details or explanation on like we could explain something like you know going over innumerables or how dll's work or any other system as well whatever people are particularly interested in we can probably do a little example code how to how to solve certain problems or you know yeah definitely so uh, i'm gonna look and just keep an eye out for questions and then i'll give you um one one of the ideas that i had that i thought would be an interesting simple one was to just make like a really simple uh tower defense type game hmm Get not get a. I'll just grab a pack. We we'll do like a, a dude running to a castle, setting up the tower. How you build a simple tower. nav mesh, and then sh- shooting shooting with a radius or whatever nearby, and yeah, yeah, building up towers, building up resources, that kind of stuff. I mean, the kind of thing that is this. What what, what had me thinking about this, and really what kind of got me on the idea was like I was thinking about games that I used to build a long time ago, like the first Unity games I built especially the first unity game i built which was somewhat like a tower defense game but a bit more complicated in multiplayer and took like a year and a half to build and i was thinking like a lot of the stuff that i built back in the day with today's tools and my knowledge now i'm building like a day <laughs> like mm. a lot of the stuff that um, i mean we had to talk about this before uh, yeah a lot of stuff you just do really really quick you can knock it out once you've done it enough times um so I thought maybe doing something like that and just seeing how quickly you can put together like a whole simple thing could, could be fun and interesting. Um, and just an inter- you kind of a weird challenge. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Uh, other thing people were saying as well about UI stuff as well, so that's always one that I find is funny. I'm a, as, as I've said to you before, I'm a big fan of UI stuff in Unity. I, I find it's not covered very often. Oh, yes. Oh, and another one, um, another type of game I've been thinking about building soon was that uh, 4X game. Mm -hmm. that, I, I talked about that a little bit in the Q&A calls. Maybe we could also do like a, uh, a UI-based game, <laughs> like a game that's just UI stuff. How you kind of put together that maybe like a um, cookie clicker type thing, something simple. Mm -hmm. You click, click, get your cookies or something. Could be fun yeah. too. So let's see, let's see what's in chat real quick. Um, oh, to, to answer your question, by the way, uh, Restless, there is um, integrating a website input with Unity. It's actually very easy. That there's um, there's a call you can make, which is effectively talking to the JavaScript on the page. You can send a payload of data back and forth. So any buttons or any objects on your screen can effectively talk to Unity and back again. So if you want literally anything, sliders outside of Unity or anything else, it's pretty straightforward. You just need to literally create a JavaScript object, uh, you know, JSON object or, you know, any other model notation. Just send the packet back and forth the data, set flags on it, fire events. It's pretty easy to do. Yeah, right, let's talk a little bit more about UI stuff then. Well, before we get into any coding, we'll we'll do some UI stuff. Or where I really, I just want to answer questions first. So yeah, uh, yeah. let's say this. So concerning UI, I would be interested in what strategies you guys use to decouple logic and visual elements. It's an interesting one. Right? Well, I, I guess w without giving the unsatisfying answer again. Um, I do have strategies, don't get me wrong. There's certain stuff I do all of the time, but I always try not to think in terms of strategies because it's it's one of those things you don't you don't like hold up a hammer and then look for something to hit. You look you have a problem and then you find the thing to apply to that problem. Um so funnily enough, I tend to try to work so you you can you can basically design from um bottom up or top down, it really depends on what you're going for. Um I tend to build the systems bottom up, but the UI top down. And so when it comes to UI patterns and things, I like to think in terms of what ideally would be, I would look at on the page. So if I had a, um, a little login menu or a health bar or something, I would start with, there is a window. The window has some panels and items and stuff on it. And I would make scripts called input box and panel and whatever. And I would just stitch them together and I would sort of uh, pass things back and forth. I, I guess one thing I would say that I've seen is a big, I want to say mistake, but sort of a lack of, of use of features that a lot of developers in Unity do is they write all of their UI code directly into their UI script. So say you've got a page, just a standard page, and you have uh, input boxes and labels and fields and buttons and all of this stuff. And the thing is, those buttons are components. They're pre-written components for you. There's lots of magic that goes on behind the scenes with on mouse over and roll over and all this other stuff that happens that boils down to if button clicked, do something. Similarly with input boxes, there's focus states and input states and all this stuff, but it all boils down to user has finished submitting text, do something. Well, you're not limited to, to using the ones they have. If you have something like what, what I do all the time is a search box. A very common thing I need is a search box. Now, a search box is more than just an input box. It is an input box where when you've stopped typing, it will, after you've typed more than X number of characters and waited a few seconds, I will try and auto-populate or fill it. If you haven't, they'll press enter to like perform a search or if you click the search button. And if it's busy, it'll do a little spinner and disable the input so that it won't, you can't type in again while you're there. And this is all logic that fundamentally is just one thing. It's a search box. And so I will make that. I will call it a search box. I will drop a search box onto my page and I will say search box dot on submitted stuff in the search box. And then whenever I get, whenever I'm doing logic on the page, I would say search box dot is busy is true. And it'll just automatically turn itself off and do a little spinner. And when I say is busy is false, it'll turn itself on and hide the spinner. And so that piece of functionality is an user control I make for myself. And I say same with tab groups. I have a tab control I make for myself that I drop a tab control on a page and then any child game object under the pages section, it'll automatically look at each page. It will create a tab for me, set up the horizontal layout group and populate a button for each tab, connect the tab to the page, apply the do between animations for it. And now you've got a nice swipeable tab group and all you have to do is drop in new pages and it'll use the game object name for the tab names. So these are the kind of things where, uh, I guess my point is, if you come from a space like WinForms or JavaScript or any other UI framework, you're used to having a nice 
library of cool drop-in features, like a lot of fully featured, um, you know, pivot tables and uh, various other groups of complicated things, file list views and stuff. And Unity doesn't give you that. Unity isn't really meant for that kind of app stuff on average. So you end up making them yourself. And if you find yourself writing 90% of your UI code in one giant file, stop and ask yourself, is it actually, is this page really all of this stuff? Or is this page just an input box and a user list and a user list has a user in it and you can just turn it into do search, get users, user list dot set users, and then all the magic happens. And you listen to an event called on user selected. All of a sudden, that UI is turned into four four lines of code rather than hundreds it would have been before. You know. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. I think a lot of time people just don't think to create and you know use custom controls in their UI stuff, or even it's kind of like just creating components that you reuse in other game parts. You know, you just want to do the same in the UI and in the UI space you want to, I would recommend looking at some of the like third party type components, the JavaScript ones, the even C sharp ones, the UI components that are out there that people make that are extra third party ones where there's like whole companies running around them. And there's also some on the asset store for Unity, where there's just extra UI components that do some some of this kind of stuff. And just look at them for inspiration and think like, how can I do similar types of things for my own projects where they, they actually apply like your search box, for example, the problem you have to solve often. So you got to make a component for it. I think that's definitely very useful stuff. Um, there was also in this question, I kind of thought like um, it's partially, I think, asking for like advice on like what to do, but it also could be just like what different types of strategies or what ways do we actually link stuff and and do the the um, the decoupling. Like, what are some examples of ways that we do it? I guess was kind of what I was thinking as another mm-hmm. way to possibly answer this question. I think that I liked the way that you answered it, but I was just kind of thinking like, a, what was another way that we could hit it too? Um, with just like a well, list look, events is probably things. a big one. Just like because that's one that I think kind of goes well with the stuff you talked about in your course is that there is a level of coupling between elements that you kind of have to reason about what you want. Um, and in general, it boils down to stuff is coupled relative to distance how how close or important things are connected and so the way i tend to look at it is uh, components are basically standalone you, you drop a component on you have an event on it it does some stuff you listen to the stuff it does and then you do other stuff related to what happened so i guess in terms of connecting things ui is a very good candidate for event-based things it, it's very much stuff happens to it or with it but it doesn't need to know about it and i find that if you're if you're giving your other objects references to your UI, you've sort of intrinsically said, so here's a, here's a like experiment that I do for my own stuff. If I have a thing, let's call it a, um, I made some TV, like a little TV that turns on or off and changes channels and does some stuff, like a little in-game channel that's got some fun stuff or whatever. If I made a UI for that, and I had the UI that would let you like navigate the channels and type in stuff and, and change the volume level, I always ask myself, can I just take the TV portion of this, copy and paste a prefab into an empty scene and press play, or will it throw an error because it's missing something? There's some piece externally that needs to be connected. And that's usually UI. People will often make something like a spawner or something, or a inventory is a big one. For, for weapon inventories, people make weapon inventories. And if you try to move the weapon inventory and move it into another scene or just play with it, it'll break and say, oh, I don't have access to the UI. It's like, well, why do you need access to the UI just to exist as an inventory of weapons? And it ends up leading to this w- weird cascade where you drop in your player and it's like, oh, player can't work because player needs to know about the nearby enemies for targeting system. Okay, so I bring in the targeting system. It's like, oh, targeting system doesn't work because it's got the enemy spawner and it needs reference to for it. And so all of a sudden you rebuilt your game again. And then you've got this exhausting copying everything over. So I would say... When, if the question is how do you decouple stuff and how do you reason about it, well, the truth is, can you use it in isolation? If you think about it, you could drop in an inventory UI that has no real inventory con- connected to it at all. It's just the UI. If I give it a list of fake items, it should be able to move them around and click them and show them and draw them and fire events about what's changed, irrespective of what I'm actually handing it. So I tend to design each piece such that if I have a... Um, you know, health bar, providing I give it any number that goes up or down, I should be able to control my health bar based on like audio levels if I want to. I don't want to, but I should be able to do it theoretically, you know? So 
just ask yourself, can you use each piece in isolation? Yeah, I think that's, that's some good advice too. And one of the things I would recommend on the direction is that in general, and I think you kind of hit on this, the objects that are tied to the UI shouldn't know about the UI. The UI element should probably know about the object that it's just being bound to. If it needs to know anything at all, if, if, if knowledge, there needs to be any coupling, it should be that direction where the UI element is binding to a health or it's binding to an inventory or a player or whatever the thing is. That element is binding to that thing and listening to events. By binding, it could just be like grabbing events off of that thing and listening to it. It could be reading some data off of it and polling. Almost never want to do that. Most of the time, you're going to want to do events, like Jason said, unless it's like something where it's every frame. If it's every frame, you don't want to be firing off and dispatching an event. But just about everything else, I would say... Um, yeah, you do events and just bind it up through th that direction, I guess, is my general rule. Yeah, and, and especially you bring up updates, a good point. Here's here's a fun little, I don't want to say tip or trick that I, I think is a good way to reason about it too. There are certain things that you instinctively want to update. So a common one of these is raycasters. I frequently write a raycasting something. That's just a common thing. Um, and if you're raycasting, there's different kinds, obviously like raycasting for characters or raycasting for collision. But if you're doing like selection, raycast with the intention of if I look at a thing, am I selecting that thing? Now that's not really events, right? That's like it is casting a ray. It is an updated constant thing. But at the same time, is it always a constant thing or is it only a constant thing when you're selecting? So what I like to do is I usually make a function called check. And that's basically update me, the Raycaster. So I can say at any time, Raycaster check, or, or selection system dot check. Now it is an update loop, but it's not an update loop. It is an update thing I can perform when I want to, which means I could say when is able to perform something, check the Raycaster. And I just, I can then loop the check in the, in the active sections. So just because something is not an event and it is an update doesn't mean it's really an update. It just means it's a thing that ticks at some rate and if you separate those two out, you can free yourself to ticking at whatever rate you want. If I wanted to say, oh, you actually don't, it does, doesn't need to be real time. What if I only call the check function every like four seconds, depending on what it is I'm doing? I don't need to. I don't have to rewrite the entire raycasting solution because I've decided to handle my tick rates differently. So try not to lock yourself in to either it must update all of the time or it must update by events. Just make a function that does what you need and call it in the place such as update, which is the, the loop you want, you know? I think for UI stuff, it's, it's almost never a case when it needs to update every frame. <laughs> Realistically, like if you need your UI to change that fast, there's something very strange is going on because it's faster than people can see. Uh, assuming yeah. you're running super fast, like oh, what what data are you changing? But yeah, so that's well, what I kind of do with with that one is probably the same as what you were saying is with binding. For for people who aren't familiar with the whole like how binding works, I guess the summary you can just say is. There's multiple things on an object that could change. And people are like, but what if this changes? How do I update my object? Well, you can either change it and then poll to see if it's changed. Or you can, again, fire some kind of event to say, oh, this has changed. But what you, what you often do in a complicated system is do a notify property changed. And what that means is there's a function internally in the object which says, I have changed. Something about me has changed. And then every single property, if you're using... Um, property syntax. So if you have like a field, you can't do this. But if using the property syntax, you could say, set the name, set the health, set the age, set the inventory, set the coins or whatever. And in every one of those calls, it just says, uh, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed, I've changed. So they all fire the same event. The event is me has changed my internal state. And now that object can expose one event, which says, I am now different than I was the last time you checked. And so somebody else who cares can listen for properties changed. And that makes it really easy for you to have an object where it's sort of smartly uh, letting people know that stuff's happened. And that's like a nice middle ground. It's an update loop that happens every time something changes. So it's not looping, but it's also not this weird events on rare cases. It is if anything changes, like a, that's a perfect case for a UI, because if something in the UI changes, probably the whole UI updates, right? There might be multiple things that have to change to do that. And so you can that, that's one way to solve it. There's other ways to get even more detailed where you pass in the property name and various things. But the point is, it's it's not really as clear cut as events and loops. There's like a lot of ways to solve this that have different granularities depending on your needs. And I, I want to clarify for everybody too on the 
property change, the I notify property change. If you're brand new to events and binding and stuff, um, you probably don't want to dive straight to that because that's going to be way more true. That's, overhead that's right. and complicated. Yeah, yeah. If you only have one property that's changing, like your health is changing, you can just fire off an event like on health changed. Listen for that instead of having it fire for multiple things because you may only have one property that changes. Maybe you got two properties that change. They change at different times and different systems care about it. In that case, you don't want to fire off a generic um, notify property changed. But that that one's more for the like an object that's more generic you've got a couple of different properties on there and any one of them could change and things care about it that's for like you like you were saying though in the context of bigger ui stuff so i want to say like that that totally is what you do in like the bigger ui contexts but in the smaller stuff like if it's just a health bar updating or a score or something um don't don't try to dive into that and you know go overboard and get yourself lost or anything <laughs> i just don't want anybody that's like new to it to go down the wrong rabbit hole yeah um, yeah and, and i think <laughs> That's why I also think that, like, the problem is that there's all these paradigms and patterns that people try to copy, and it starts to, it muddies the fact that if you step back and think about it, a lot of this stuff can be reasoned out. Like, for example, we have this idea that you want to set the health, and you want to be updated when the health changes. If you forget about patterns and events versus updates versus everything, just ask yourself what you're saying. I change this thing, and then I want somebody to be able to be notified when that happens. So... There's actually a lot of ways you could do that. You could say when the thing changes, it tells people. You could say check all the time, just keep looking at it. Or you could say as the person who's changing it, what if I change it and then press a button to say it has changed, let people know. Like there's lots of ways. Sometimes sometimes you do that, right? You basically change a load of properties and then call has changed or update. Or like a dirty or flag or yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So there's like a lot of ways. And I, I think the problem is if people try too hard to follow patterns and stuff they see online, they kind of they lose the why of it. So I would recommend rather than trying to match various different things or asking for specific strategies and patterns, ask what your ask what your problem is. Ask is it like I have this thing, it needs to update and I need to let people know that it is updated. What are my options? If I forget about all the code and fanciness and patterns, what logical options do I have here? I can do it if A, B, or C, and then just try them. Each one is only a few lines of code. Try out different things and sort of learn how your systems connect. And you'll find that, as, as weird as it sounds, it's a lot more intuitive than you think. It's actually, it, it only gets complicated when you start trying to think as a programmer rather than just reason about solving a problem, you know? Yeah, and if you try it and it, yeah, I would try multiple things, like like you were saying. I think like, make sure that you just commit, go in, try it out, experiment a little bit, delete, and then try something else. And if you don't like the second one, just go back to the first one. Right? Like, experiment a little bit and try a couple different options because it's really easy for people. I think we talked about this. Um, maybe it was in the last Q and A call. I don't remember about people just coding themselves kind of into a corner. It might have been yeah, and just like you get this idea, you start coding out this system and building it this certain way. And you get that sunk cost fallacy where you feel like, well, now I've just got to keep building on top of this instead of just deleting the entire thing, replacing it with something that's going to be better and simpler, you know, your second time through, your third time through. As as much as you might hate to admit it, your code is never going to be the best it can be the first time through, right? It's going to be better the second time and even better the third and fourth and fifth. Hey, as you keep iterating, it, it should be continually getting better, so... All right, you want to jump on to another question here about what you do when you're getting stuck in some part of development of a game? I know what Please. I do. <laughs> Step away. Get away from it for yeah. a few minutes and you got to relax, yeah. That's exactly what I'll do. I'll step away and I'll either, um, if I can't get back into it, I'll start working on something superficial in the game, maybe a little bit of polish thing or some little side thing that I kind of want to experiment with, like a new feature that I'm kind of curious about while I'm thinking and like resetting my brain. Um, if I get really stuck though, and I can't get past that, then I start reaching out to people for help. I, I start asking friends, getting on calls with people saying, hey, can you look at this? I'm trying to find some ideas and ways to to fix this problem and to make, you know, make it past this part. Um, that's when I'm stuck on the problem and it's not the kind of thing that I can sleep off and figure out the next day or the next couple of days. Well, yeah, I, I've actually know. come to a conclusion for me personally. I actually think it's one of these, this is a deceptive problem because <clears throat> when, when, you're, when you have an issue that you can't solve, 
you often think the problem is the fact that you can't solve it, that that's the thing that's wrong, that I'm frustrated and whatever. But here's the thing. We've had tons of problems in programming where we can't solve it. We eventually do and everything's fine. Other problems just stick in our head forever and they just get really frustrated and you can't get any work done. And so I've kind of come to the conclusion, for me at least, the problem isn't solving the problem. The problem is that while I'm solving a problem, I'm not making forward progress. And over time, I start to notice more time goes by and I, I'm looking at the project and it's exactly the same now as it was two days ago. And that's the killer. That's the stuff which really destroys all motivation because you feel like you've just spent two days running in circles with no progress. So for me, the way I've solved that particular like kind of thing that ruins all of my motivation is to notice when I'm about to start a, tr a chain of no progress. If I'm working on a project or a problem and I've hit like an hour of it and I can't solve it or two hours or whatever, and I'm like, if I keep banging my head against this, it's going to minimum take me a few more hours or maybe even a day. I'm sort of locked in to not doing any progress I can physically see for hours. And that's going to just make me less motivated to work on the project and so on and so on. So my solution is easy wins. I have a little bucket on the side of tasks, which are just like make the UI prettier or change the colors of this thing or stuff that will fundamentally add value, but aren't hyper important. And so if you ever find yourself in that rut of not being able to make any progress, just cut the loop of what you're doing, go to something else, pick something easy to win. And that way you're not just giving yourself a break, but you are still making forward progress, which means at the end of the day, you can look at it and go, well, at least it's different. I've changed something and you'll find yourself. It's easier to get back into it tomorrow than if you just kept plugging away at the same problem, because you look at it and go, I got nothing done yesterday. Am I even a programmer? What am I doing with my life? But if you at least put something in and something changes, you'll, you'll be able to walk away from it going, I didn't get what I wanted done, but I got something done. And that very subtle change in your sort of psychology will will make you a lot happier with working on stuff. I like the idea of having that as a list too, of just things that you can hit right away. Normally, I just think think about it. I'm trying to like, what's an easy one I can do? That's kind of my thought. It's like, what's an easy one or or an experiment that I've been waiting to blow some time on? But um, I like the idea of just having a nice little list of like easy wins that you can hit that kind of spare time. W one of the things I would do like uh, at Sony was just go through the backlog. So to get stuck on something and just I'd be struggling or like waiting, not really sure what I was going to do about it. I would go through the backlog and just grab a couple bugs. I'd find like bugs that looked easy. Uh, oh, let's go knock out like five, 10 little easy bugs. You know, go do those ones real quick. Kind of get back into the code, get back into um, fixing things and making a lot of forward progress and getting that motivation. And then yeah, get, get what, some of that. Funny is with the, with the bug fixing, I actually used to do it with refactors. I used to say, oh, if I'm ever stuck, I'll do refactoring. But here's the thing. That's a mistake. I've learned that if you if your go-to, like, oh, I need a break from this, I'm going to go refactor, the problem is still the same. Because I, I, I knew I still felt crappy afterwards. I'm like, why is that? Well, because the problem is still there. You end your day with nothing having changed. And that's the killer. So it's not just the fact that you um, that you didn't get what you wanted done. It's that you got nothing done. So if your instinct is, I can't do this, I'll go do something else, I'll just clean up the code, don't do that, because that, that'll make it worse. What you actually want to do is want something like that, an easy win, something that will actually improve the project. So I, again, I used to do that all the time, and I suddenly realized, why is it that even a full day of refactoring, I still feel like I've wasted my time? It's because I was refactoring, because I couldn't solve a problem, and now I've just done two sets of things that do nothing to the project, and that makes me feel terrible, so... That's, that's some really good insight because that's something that I used to do too. And I never really realized it that um, it's still kind of getting that same effect because yeah, I'd refactor it. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's the same. Now it just still doesn't do what I want to do and I still don't know how to do it. <laughs> All right. We got a question that I thought this is actually kind of interesting. How would it, creating a skill trainer be different from creating a merchant? Because in general, they're relatively similar. There's not a whole lot different, right? You, depending on how you do it, you could theoretically make them completely different, code them up as completely different systems. But in general, a skill trainer system, especially if it's one where you're just buying a new skill, like not leveling up skills, but you're buying a specific skill, just like you're buying a merchant, should be almost exactly the same. Just the type of thing that's being held by that merchant or trainer or whatever the shared script is would probably be a different type of object and the ui would be a little bit different for it um outside of that um 
I would imagine the code to be very similar again, barring there being like totally different systems. The skill trainer has got like a whole tree set of requirements and other stuff, um, or has multiple levels of skills. Maybe it's totally different, but assuming it's a a similar one-to-one match, I I would imagine they'd be almost exactly the same where you've got a merchant that's got a set of things that are either probably scriptable objects, maybe prefabs or something else that are on its object, either on its um, the little component there or stored off somewhere else. And then it would spawn, have all those items be bindable to a UI and you click on them and buy them. Um, yeah, I don't know. How, can you, how, what do you think about it? How would they be different? Um, well, I, I would be, say... I, think no, I, 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 I agree with you. I, I think they're mostly the same. I, I think this it's probably one of the hardest things to do as a programmer is that you're you have to sort of learn how to where to draw the boundary lines where where is the where is this thing different than this other thing and honestly it's just an experience thing it's just the more you do it you kind of get better at knowing which ones will annoy you and which ones actually make your life easier and i would look at a merchant and i would say well what is a merchant really is it a shop not really is it a dialogue thing not really at the end of the day it is a player goes up to it do you have stuff for player if you do have stuff for player here is the stuff show them the stuff they can pick one of the stuff if they are are is player able to purchase the thing do, do they have the prerequisite resources whether it's level whether it's money it doesn't actually matter what it is but the questions you're asking are always the same do i have something for you show all the things i have for you you pick one of them can you have that thing have you qualified for whatever you need to for that thing thumbs up or thumbs down give them the thing whatever that means and that contract will apply to anything from upgrade systems to shops to skill trainers, to, you know, quest givers. It doesn't matter what it is. Every single thing will boil down to pretty much that same contract. Now, internal implementation can be different, but when we talk about patterns, something that a lot of people have an issue with is public-facing contracts. And so, for example, if you look at what the command pattern does, the command pattern is, is it's literally one thing. It's execute, do thing. But command patterns represent so much of the code you interact with, you don't realize it. Every file system menu, every undo or redo system, every button or menu or every icon in Chrome, almost all of these are a command. Because what a command is, is just a promise to do a thing when interacted with and nothing else. And you realize that is an insanely powerful contract. It promises nothing, but gives you nearly everything. And so the same thing could be true of your game. If you can draw those boundary lines correctly, you can basically say, what is a selection system anyway? Is there thing nearby? If there is that I can see, pick it. If I've picked it, can I interact with it? If I can, interact with it. All of a sudden, you've made an interaction system that makes everything from you know, collecting coins to firing targets to heat seeking. It doesn't matter what it is. The concept of the contract is still the same. So... It's hard to do, and I would say probably my number one advice is if you try to guess it, you'll get it wrong, because I try to guess it all the time, and I always get it wrong. And so what I do instead is I make one, and that comes back to the like uh, what Jason was saying about making sim- silly examples or prototypes or tests. Do the tests. Make the thing that shoots the other thing. Make the thing that selects the other thing. And try to challenge yourself to write it in the least amount of code possible. And if it works, you're like, oh, cool, this works with a few lines of code. Pick something completely different but like follows the same contract, like a selection system versus a targeting system versus a picker or an inventory picker or something. Try to make it, again, few lines, fewest lines of code possible, and then step back and go, can I extract something common from all of these? And you'll find that it's it's normally, it's only after you've made them that you can start to see where the real lines are. But over time, then you'll, you'll, you'll kind of have a mental list of which ones are easy to separate and which ones aren't. But that's probably like the number one skill over the course of a programming career that'll make your life easier. Pre-guessing where things are going to change and where things are going to break. And you won't know that until you've done a million things that all have these boundary lines you've drawn for yourself to sort of solve problems. Yeah, that's why I like to just set up as many systems as possible, get them kind of loosely integrated and see. Like I would, if I was building this, a skill, skill trainer and a merchant, and I thought that they were going to be relatable. And I thought, you know, there's a good chance that these are going to be somewhat similar. Maybe they'll be reusing code, maybe not. I would start coding both of the systems, get them both up and running with the fundamentals and the basics of them before polishing either one of them. Make them both kind of functional, figure out the, like you said, the interfaces, how they're going to interact with themselves, with each other and all the other systems. Like, I mean, these ones probably wouldn't interact with each other very much, but 
and you'd get a lot of idea and just I think uh, you come up with a better solution than if you try to pre guess yeah. it like like you're saying. But, uh, like my instinct for this would be that there'd be these these things and then there'd be some kind of like resource shop, not like a physical shop, but like a this is a pile of stuff that is available to a that player. That can be buyable, right? Yeah, and, and you can hand the same kind of shop to either person. It's just okay. one is selling skills and one is selling um you know consumables but the thing is the way you would surface that's different like maybe the shop maybe the skill trainer never actually shows them to you maybe there's never actually a grid of them maybe Mm -hmm. they only give you whatever their latest one is but conceptually the same thing is there's still a shop there's the shop that you don't get to pick from they just give you the next leveled matching one to your thing and so you could argue that like it's still a, a resource collection of things you can give a player and then a thing that knows how to give stuff to a player and whether or not they want to dole it out themselves, randomly gift you one, give you one based on a rule. I mean, is that also a loot system? Could it be the exact same code that basically on death of an enemy picks an object for you? At the end of the day, it's just a collection of items that provides one of them. If you have a thing and a rule to pick a thing, like again, it's probably best not to pre-guess all of these, but as you go through it, you'll start to notice that there's a lot of similarities and systems that you can sort of extract out, you know? Yes. Uh, yeah, you'll start to see those. One thing to watch out for, too, though, is um, when you do reuse stuff, make sure that you don't reuse things in a way that's going to confuse the crap out of everybody else on the team or the designers. Like, don't um, have it so that you've got, like, this item table, like a merchant table that gets added onto a skill trainer, and you have to put the items in a specific way and then go set up other properties on each of the items to make it work. Make it obvious and easy to use for both types of uses. Or all of the, if you're going to reuse something, just make sure that it's easily reused and not just kind of hacked in because it was easy to code, but a pain in the ass to use with designed side. Because if you do that, the designer yeah. won't use it or they'll mess it up or you'll end up mm-hmm. changing it, fixing it later. That's another one that like, that's a huge, huge mistake people make all the time, which is decoupling is not the same as avoiding duplication. People look at those two things and go, oh, if I just take everything, if I every line, if I write set color and I extract out the set color function, I'll just use set color everywhere and I can solve that problem forever. It's like there is multiple ways the color might be set differently. You might be setting it as a property block. You might be setting it on a material. You might be setting it on an image um, and you could extract out a common interface. But if you've now done that and the rules change and it changes in that one place, you could break a million different things. So the line to draw isn't on set color. It's the thing that needs its color set, the other thing that needs its color set. So it's it's one of those things you'd be very careful. And that's kind of why if you're kind of getting into the philosophy of this. That's why people advise against singletons. The truth is singletons aren't actually that bad. What they are, though, is they're a version of tight coupling that you will pay for later. You're not paying for it now, but sometime down the line, You'll just go, oh, this is easy. I can just grab that thing because it's public. And you'll just keep doing that. And you'll keep getting to the point where at some stage you'll want to change something and go, oh, God, I've tied this into 18 things, haven't I? Well, I can't do anything with this now. And so the only reason people warn against singletons is because if you don't really understand what they're doing, um, or the consequences at least, you'll, you'll find yourself having trouble later. And so in general, that, that's why I said rather than aim for... Um, the, the problem of like decoupling or making it cleaner, try to go with the philosophy of if I took this one piece out of my application, if I took, if I wanted to, to reuse the health bar or reuse the player or reuse the gun only and not the rest of the stuff, or if I wanted all of the shop stuff, but I'm not actually making a um, MMO, so I don't need the MMO menu system for the shop. I just need the like logic of buying and selling inventory. How much of the thing that you need could you take out without like having a panic attack, trying to draw all the lines and recover everything. Like spawning and enemy waves and pooling are technically all tied together, but they're also very valuable systems in and of themselves that might be useful to have separately that you could then use for different things. So learning to have each one be a thing and then tie them together into a bigger thing means you can either take the bigger thing or take the smaller things, but you have to kind of realize where you're you're kind of tying yourself up in knots. And that's usually comes down to mostly again experience but it comes down to just take small bite-sized chunks don't don't try to solve all of the things and tie everything together more great advice um if anybody liked the advice make sure you hit the like button and go share the video by the way 
just go share a stream on Facebook or somewhere. Um, I'm going to jump up to a, another question. We're like 20 minutes behind on questions and a bunch are coming through. So I figured we'll just start tearing through a couple more. How would you approach nav meshes where only boats can traverse water and there's boarding slash unboarding of said boats? Uh, for me, that doesn't seem too complicated. I would imagine you would just take all you would set up in the nav mesh system multiple layers you could set up a boats only layer make that an area that's boats only over the water and then set the boats nav mesh agent to be able to walk on there for the boarding and unboarding you'd probably want to have some just some code in there to check once you get to a certain distance and then stop using the nav mesh either you know move the object right over there pop it over there lerp it over there or something else so that it's no longer navigating to do the actual getting on to the object because yeah. the object would be like a moving object anyway that's so i, I would so, so, I, so that's one i think a lot of people too get, get a bit confused on just because you're using nav mesh doesn't mean you have to always use nav mesh you can use it for the problems it can solve and don't use it for the things it can't so if you've got a thing like a boat that's moving along and it gets to a dock maybe you turn off the nav mesh and like go through an animated or scripted or or kind of set sequence of doing the onboarding portion and then reactivate it. If you want a kind of better example of this, uh, say you had a tank and a tank needs to drive with like real tank controls, like proper threads and tires and it's moving along, doing all the complicated stuff. The, the normal nav mesh code mightn't really help you there because you don't want it to like rotate on the spot and look for targets. You want to actually like trundle along, but but also be vaguely on the nav mesh. What you can do is you could do something like have an invisible nav mesh object that generates a vector in terms of path directions and then feed that vector to your tank. So you can either control the tank by pressing up, down, left, right, or you can have this invisible object that like represents something that knows how to walk on the terrain that then feeds you just right in front of you the position of where you should go. So use it for what it's valuable for and then skip the parts where it's going to cause you a headache. Yeah, that's good advice. And that's a good trick for a lot of things. The having an invisible nav mesh agent that you're following around or using as your target or goal to to sit, drive some other navigation or movement system is a really popular way to do it. Um, let's see what else we got here for questions. There are a couple of game ideas, a game that uses delegates and lambdas to come off a queue. Be interesting. It could be interesting to do a game sometime where it's like controlled by uh, chat again too. That could be a fun one to <laughs> put together. I don't know that it'd be fun to build um live though because it's really really hard to debug and impossible to see the chat. Um, let's let's check another one. Oh, instead of instantiating items, player would you flip switches of the player script? Oh, flag slash abilities on the player. Okay, so here, this is kind of a follow up on our inventory, on our items merchant versus skill merchant, right? Um, in this case, so the question, let's go go back, going back to the question, how would you set up a merchant, a skill merchant versus an item merchant in the terms of like spawning an item versus setting an ability? I would most definitely almost definitely do those in different ways because with an item i would usually want to be spawning and instantiating them there are cases though i mean there are definitely games where there's a set number of items spawned and placed no new items are spawning and i could just be setting that on the character like they've only got one item that they get think of like cuphead right like you go buy a gun and you have that new gun that, that's a, there's there's maybe like six items i probably don't need to instantiate something into the player's inventory just set a flag that they've unlocked that gun and that's the one they have but for a normal inventory system going around like an rpg you're picking up you know a bunch of trees chopping down wood or whatever yeah i'd be spawning items either instantiating items or setting some data um and then possibly instantiating a visual representation of that item if i need the representation of it and then storing that data somewhere for the flags and abilities it could be as simple as just flipping some data, like having a data structure that has all of my flags and abilities. It could also just be um, setting a scriptable object flag or something and then saving that off later. So you could do something like that. Um, but yes, those would definitely be different. Now, yeah. the way that I would handle it is like, kind of like Jason was saying, have like a similar interface or similar, um, uh, I guess, yes, an, an interface for the thing that you're purchasing. So once you've purchased the item, it could do whatever it wants to do. It could add the item to your inventory if there's an item linked to it or the purchasable thing. It doesn't have to be an item or it could um, set a flag or run some unity event or whatever dozen different things, depending on the type of game and the types of things I needed to do. Um, 
Yeah, so I think you bring up a very good point there. Is That's one of those things that's secretly more than one system or question. So for example, previously we talked about the concept of buying something. Well, how you buy it is technically the same. How you are kind of given the unlock of the thing, whether it's, you know, as I said, you can I have this thing? Do you have the prerequisites you need? Here you go, have thing. Now, that's one entire system that does have a lot of repetition, but how that thing is literally unlocked and given to you vastly different. And so an example of this, and this is, this, I love this question because it's one of those ones I unironically would used to sit and think about this for days. Like it used to really frustrate me because I love uh, strategy patterns and all the fancy decoupling magic. And I was like, surely there's got a way I can have a character who I can just give them any combination of abilities. And it would be so cool. It'd be so, I could just modularly make whatever I want. But then reality hits in and you're like, well, if you give a character a jump and a slide and a dash and a whatever, there are cases where if jumping and sliding, if dashing and whatever, and you're like, you have to do stuff based on the combination of those systems. And if you're being logical to yourself, the amount of code it would take for you to have every one of these things separate, pluggable, and then interchangeable with events, and then also be able to work and like alter velocities based on combinations is such an unnecessary mess of code. When the truth of the matter is, they're all one thing. They're all things that affect the player's vector movement or whatever, and different abilities are either true or false in them. So I guess my point is, I learned the very hard but valuable lesson that in, in a case like character controllers, a lot of abilities are just better off to be flags. Like, you're not, you're not going to be... If your character has 6 or 10 or even 50 unlockable abilities over the course of a game, realistically, they tend to be increments jump and double jump or thing and other thing. And you sort of, you're better off hitting a flag and incrementing numbers than you are trying to make some composable set of strategic things that can be interchanged and swapped. And that's why, again, I think what I'm alluding to what Jason was saying is that's why it's different from an inventory because an inventory is discrete things that you are given, you have, and you can like take away. They're a great candidate for keys or quest items or other stuff. That makes sense because those things are arbitrary, random, infinite. There's lots of stuff you can do with those and they have different reasons you might want to have them. Things which give you health, things which unlock doors, things which change dialogue and scripts, lots of different things. But abilities are usually stuff where once you unlock them, they vastly change the state of play and there's a lot of interoperating systems. So I guess the the short answer is use the right tool for the right job. Like you, you might try to solve all problems all the time, but if you're being honest and you sit back and you want to avoid the most amount of stress, some things are better as just a collection of flags. Some things are better as inventory. It's just a question of what is easier to work with and use for you personally. So, Yeah, it's it's hard to not want to just reuse stuff too, though. I've gotten, I, I got past that a, a while ago, but I remember a long time ago, I got to the point of learning that I could reuse my code and I just wanted to reuse everything as much as possible. Uh, <laughs> it, it can be interesting. So let's see. Somebody said they're using lean, let's see, lean tween for UI animations. Is that what you would normally do? Now, I know you use some tweening libraries. Is I use lean tween. Yeah. No, I, lean tween's good. I, I've used lean tween. Um, the, and I'll okay, say, I've used lean tween. I've used, there's actually a really like lightweight single file tweening library as well, somewhere on, on GitHub. It's really nice. Uh, I've also written my own. I've also just used coroutines and curves. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. And I've actually, I used to have an article about this until um, uh, Unity, the, the community thing got taken down. But effectively, as weird as it sounds, interpolation is actually a really simple line of code. So the idea is you've got your start, you've got your destination. What's the difference between your start and your destination? Well, there's some difference there, right? And so what is the difference? Well, if if you had start plus end minus start, but you end, you end up with this weird thing where you can just multiply it by a percentage. And if you do that to zero to one, it just adds a different amount of the distance. My point is, it's like a single line with like four characters in it that says start plus the end, but multiply it a little bit based on what percentage. So all tweening, regardless of which one you're using, is really four lines of code. It's just the same thing. It's just all the fanciness that sits on top of it. The timers, the pooling, the curves, the adjustments, the whatever that really comes down to which library you're using, who's more efficient and what they cover and what they do and which ones have automated functions to make things easier. So the truth is, if, if you want a fun experiment with that, just write your own tweeting library at least once. It should only take you a day or so to figure out the basics. Um, you can literally just write 
a single function and it'll demonstrate most things working. And then once you kind of understand the mechanics, you, you, you kind of, you'll care less. It'll kind of come down to which thing has the nicest syntax. And personally, I like the uh, fluent syntax that Dootween gives you. Um, LeanTween uses a hash map style approach, which is good, works fine. It's just, it's a little bit, it looks very codey. And I have a general rule in my code. I like it to read like, a, as Grady Bush would say, well-written prose. I like my code to read linguistically. And so saying thing dot do this, then on complete do this reads very nicely for me. But it doesn't matter. That's entirely stylistic. The fact is, tweening is realistically just saying, I have thing at value A, I want thing at value B, iterate over time between value A and value B. And if you want to go a little bit fancier, put a curve in between there and say, don't iterate linearly. Instead, follow this curve up or down. That's all you're doing. And so the really basic, you could literally expose an animation curve uh, on, in your inspector, take your value from zero to one, pass it through that animation curve over X seconds, and then everything can now LERP. That's it. It's as simple as that. If you learn how to do it once, there's not a single property in your project or game you can't just very quickly make a curve for. Um, the difference is, do you want to set up an animation curve, a coroutine, and four lines of code for every LERP, or do you want to write do bounce, do jump, do slide, and just encapsulate those? So what I tend to do is I, I pick something that I do a lot, I wrap it in what's called a do tween sequence, and I have that one sequence I then apply like a single interpolation. So a common one I do is there's a very fancy UI swishy thing that a lot of UIs do, where if you've got two things and you're swapping one out for another, what you do is the old one hides immediately, the new one comes in pretty quickly, but off position, and then fades in and slides up at the same time, all in one motion. If you do that, it's this really nice dynamic how most menus swap things out. And so I have a little thing called do cool swishy animation. And it basically, I, I pass in uh, the start thing, the end thing, and how much offset to give it in a vector direction and how much time it takes. And it does all of the tweening and curving and niceness and whatever. And it's one line. And it's those kinds of things are are ubiquitous enough that you know you can just swap them out where it needs to be. So I would say just learn the basics of how tweening actually works and the rest of it will kind of follow from there. I like the idea of just building your own little tweening library too. Just try that out as an experiment, like a learning practice experiment, not in your real projects, just go do it in an empty one and, and build it out and try it so you can understand how the systems work. Cause they, you know, like you said, they're really not that complicated. And I was actually thinking about doing a video on curves. Somebody had recommended it. I've got it on my list and like a little sample project kind of started up. So if people are interested in that, um, make sure you hit the like button and let me know in the chat and, if it's super popular, maybe I'll do that one earlier this week than later. I was thinking maybe in the next couple of weeks, but you know, I hit that one soon because I think it's interesting to just talk about. It. I think it's weird. A lot of people don't realize that they exist and just how cool they are and the kinds of stuff that you can do with them. So it's a, uh, and just how easy they are to use too. Like I said, four lines of code, relatively simple. If you can divide and call dot evaluate, you can pretty much do it. Right? Yeah, and like I said, like it's really, it, it blows your mind when you realize how, what you're actually saying. Like you're saying, I have a thing. I have the number two. I want to get to the number four. What is the difference between two and four? It's two. I can tell that intuitively. How do I get there? Well, oh. it's subtract one from the other, right? That's the difference of how much is there. So if I subtract one from the other, that's how much distance is there. Now, what happens if I apply zero of that distance? I'm at the start. What happens if I apply all of that distance? I'm at the end. What happens if I apply half of that distance? I'm halfway between the two. Holy crap, that's it. That's the entire interpolation function. It is get distance oh. of the thing between them, multiply it by zero to one, done. That is all interpolation is. And yeah. then you ask yourself, do I go zero to one over linear time? Or do I go zero, zero, zero point one, zero, 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 zero point into one? Like that's all the curve is. It's yeah, just okay. applying the same number in a nice little curve. switch. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, really straightforward. Curve. I can't do a curve with my finger backwards there. <laughs> Curved. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, curves and lerping. I remember when I first learned about lerp as just a method in, in code. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. It I don't like know. Magic. I was like, yeah, hey, it was crazy complicated. Yeah. I was like, I at first was like trying to figure it out. I'm like, okay, I can write this code. And they're like, oh, it already freaking exists as a method. I was like, every, all the math stuff that I spent all this time learning already exists as methods. <laughs> all right. So, Here's another one. Are people allowed to make games based on a brand if it's not sold, but given away for free, like Star Wars, for example? Also, what if it's locked <laughs> behind a paywall like Patreon? 
First off, um, neither one of us is a lawyer or no, I assume knows anything about it. Yeah, no, My guess I, is I, that I, that I, sounds like uh, they're just going to sue you. <laughs> like If you do it, like they're going to send you a cease and desist order or sue you. Not, not something I would want to try. Um, if it was something I was not releasing and just playing around for fun and never going to give out, sure. But if you're giving it away, I'd, I'd be hesitant. <laughs> so I would say more from a just general advice thing. Because I've done this myself. I have been the guy, I have made Zelda fan games. Specifically, I made 2D versions of Majora's Mask back in the day and other things like that. Um, and it's really fun. It's a great way to learn. But I would say, as just general advice, if you're working on a project and it feels like it has legs, it starts to get fun or interesting, or you're like, ooh, I, I want to take this further, you will never get anywhere using someone else's license. Like, even if you succeed, if you become the most popular game in the world, like, there's two games I really love. One of them's a, a Jet Set Radio Future. There is, most people don't know this, a multiplayer made in Unity Jet Set Radio Future. You can download it and play it. It's awesome. It's like the whole game, multiplayer, extra features, extra maps. And that game is so good and so much fun, it kind of deserves to be a paid product on Steam. But it can't be, and it never will be, because you just can't monetize something that isn't yours. So... I kind of look at that and go, as much as I love it for nostalgia, if I was being completely honest, I wish they'd made a non-version of that game, it could have been just their own version, and then made like a skin pack that mods it to look like what they wanted to, right? Because then they can, they, then they do what they like, they can have all the fun with it, and then style it afterwards. And I find that it's very, it's unfair to yourself to make something and put so much effort into it, that you just simply can't get the full maximum potential out of it. So it is good for learning, but honestly, like, just instead, just take inspiration and make something very close. If you like a character or if you like a thing, put something in that universe, hypothetically, but just make your own thing. And that way that you're you're able to put all the effort in, you get to enjoy it, but at the same time, you might actually be able to make money or do something with it. So I, I would usually caution against it, unless you're like literally in the modding scene, modding retro games. I would just, if, if you're making something from scratch, I would just say, you know, make it yourself for for yourself you know yeah i tend to agree and when it comes to star wars like just there's so much stuff that's out there now for lightsabers that used to be something i was worried about but i get i don't think that that's actually an issue i think that pretty much anybody can make like their own version of it as long as it's not yeah, an actual people copy. call it light swords as long as you've yeah. got some version of light swords you're fine as long as you're I not remember, literally calling them sabers or whatever i was like terrified to make a vr lightsaber game when the headsets came out i was like disney's gonna send me to jail or come <laughs> 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 they're just down the street they're just gonna show up but then people started along. releasing all kinds yeah. of them they were super popular and i was like oh okay apparently this is not you know again i'm not a lawyer i don't know shit about the law i just <laughs> I just sit here like terrified of big companies attacking me so like i don't, I don't want to get sued by disney so but yeah you can apparently from what i can tell make lightsaber or light swords like you said <laughs> just don't don't again don't copy them so if that, if that was like the, the thing, but for spaceships, there's so many spaceships out there and so many cool packs and you can get artists to make spaceships all day long. So there definitely make some, some cool stuff on your own there too. Um, let's see. There was a question here that I don't know anything about and I wasn't sure if you do. How does robotics process automation affect game dev industry? Do you know? I'm not heard that term before. I've done robotic stuff in Unity. I don't know specifically what. I'm not. Yeah, I don't know. I know that. Yeah, that a lot of stuff is being like automation stuff is being done in Unity, just because it's easy to do. You can build automated or build out automations and then build out automation training and and simulated simulating the automations in advance too. But um, and I I think I've even seen it for like doing robotics to control the robotics where they're recording the. Actually, I know that recording the mo the movements of the devices and stuff. Didn't you do something like that too? I did. Yeah, I literally had, I, I was one of my, I had a client job where I was literally <laughs> controlling robot arms based on that. Yeah. Like thing. recording it in, in the game engine and then, and then playing it back. I'm right. Yeah. So, but yeah, I don't know how it's affecting the industry other than maybe making, adding more money to it <laughs> to find out. There's something more. Uh, one, thing I, one thing I posted a link there too, cause I found, I just had a look. So I, the, I wrote an article five years ago on on how interpolation works and it was up it was up on uh unity connect until it was taken down and so unity connect is gone but here's the way back machine version of it so this is this is my at least basic explanation of the fundamentals of how lerp works so 
it's uh it should give you the idea nice did you, did you drop it in chat already yep oh sorry i don't think it works when i i think you have to do it because if i post links it tends to get eaten i don't think oh, it's okay they, they rob you of the links there we go it is posted yeah. now so everybody can go check yeah. that out but there you go it's, it's it's basically you can see the idea I'm, I'm sort of saying that it's just it is literally just numbers and it's like you can we can actually go down as far as seeing what the the code is and then actually how unity's code that's the decompiled version of unity's lerp it's the same function as i'm explaining it's just all they do is they add a clamp zero one to it so part two anyway, that'll I hope there's four, there's three parts, four parts. I don't know. It, oh, you may have no. to go to Spelunking to find it. It probably won't be there if I'm being honest. It's usually yeah, most of the stuff is dead. Yeah. Nice. I'll, I'll so have to add it to my different. list of things to redo at some stage and make a more up to date one. Get to make a full video on showing it. Maybe focus on UI. People always want to know how to make swishy UI stuff. Maybe I'll do do all of this and do like all of the UI animations and things. Uh, yeah, I think that would be really popular. All right, let's see what else we had for questions. A couple more up above, I think. Oh, oh that's come up a couple times. That's one for you, actually. Yeah, the 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 3D, how to add 3D elements to the canvas. That's something that I know um, that that for it's very MMO driven, right? A lot of people like to have their characters visible on the UI. Oh yes. So that's usually set up with a secondary camera. So we'll set up a second camera that's um, very often not. Sometimes it's looking at the actual character. So some sometimes you'll see, and for anybody that's curious what this is, like you've got a game, you've got a 3D character, and then you've got like maybe an inventory or a character sheet view or something that's got a portrait of your character. Usually it's animated, got your gear on, they're moving around and doing whatever, just standing still. The main ways that I've done this before are a camera that's either looking at the active character. This is kind of rare, but sometimes I do it on the active character where it's kind of like up in front of their face, flips on, renders out to a render texture, and then just gets kind of slapped into an image there. So you're seeing another shot of the character from behind. Most of the time, though, that's not what we do. Usually, we'll there's have a little a... black box somewhere with a character like under the floor, who's the real one, yeah, <laughs> or the exactly. one exactly. So yeah. I have another version of the character. There'll be a little black empty room or something that, that whatever the background is that we want to have in there. It could be like the menu screen or something like that. A little room, and then the, another version of your character is there. That's usually not the actual full version of your character. That's got all the animation and all that stuff. It's like a single one that's either static or doing a set, set of animations that just shows the visuals and we're just rendering that instead. Um, those are the two main ways. I mean, a lot of time, if you do the one that's right in front of the face, then like when you're running around, all you get all of the cool stuff that's going on in the background, but you also have the animations and stuff showing in there. It could get a little bit weird. And you also can get some performance problems because you're yeah, rendering yeah. the whole world again instead of just rendering this little lower poly version of the character that's in a dark room. So you, a lot of time I'll start with like the camera on the face as my quick hacking one and then speed it up when we need to and, and add in an optimized version later. Yeah, especially because, as you said, if you've got a camera facing the back for your character and a camera facing the front for rendering, they're <laughs> rendering everything around them, and all of a sudden, all of that cool culling stuff that normally makes it more performant goes out the window. Yeah. Um, it's for for people who don't know, by the way, because it's it's hard to it's, it's probably hard to visualize what we mean. Uh, in the real world, you think of a camera as a thing you point at and it captures what you see, but in games, cameras aren't really cameras. Like they they're called cameras, and we call them cameras because it's easier to reason about. But what they actually are is they're kind of render passes. You, you draw a rectangle looking into your game world or a frustrum, and you basically say, draw things step by step. Draw the background, then draw the trees, then draw the whatever, then draw the next thing, up and up and up until it's done, and all the post-processing effects. Now, why is this important? Well, because you can do what are called clear flags. You can effectively choose any level at which to draw or not to draw whatever it is you're looking at. And so there's a lot of really cool, hacky things you can do which revolve around playing with the camera. So for example, some people will draw their UI using a separate camera so they can apply different effects or turn off all the effects to the UI. Uh, another common one is if you have a gun on a character in a first-person shooter and you walk up to a wall, that gun's going to clip through the wall. Like, your your character's collider's here, the gun goes out to here. I mean, logically, if you walk into a wall, that gun's going to stick right into the wall. It'll look really silly. So what a lot of games do, and if you try this, go play games like Doom or, or Fallout, if you ask, ask yourself, how come, regardless how tall my gun is, it never clips into the wall, no matter how close to a wall I'm getting? That seems really weird. 
Well, it's because they're drawing the gun again, this exact same gun, a second time, clearing everything else. So there's one camera that draws you and one camera that draws just the gun. And the camera that draws just the gun is sitting on top of everything else. So once you go up to the wall, your actual gun is clipping to the wall, but the gun would then clip over the top of it because it's drawn again on top of it. So that's what I mean about cameras aren't really cameras. They're things that draw things. And you can layer them on top of each other like cells or frames of animation. And so there's a lot of magic you can do with that where you could say, what if I made a camera over here, which looks this thing, it doesn't draw its background, doesn't draw anything else. It just draws this thing. And then I take the output of that camera as this drawn thing and I place it over here on top of this other thing. And like you can do all sorts of interesting and crazy stuff with that. So in general, that's kind of the idea. If you have a 3D element in a, in a UI, the fact is it's probably actually a 3D element somewhere. It's just probably not what you're looking at. It's, it, might, it might actually be right in front of you, but invisible. Because what you can often do is have an object that's invisible to the main camera, but visible to everything else. So right in front of you could be the big 3D thing that's spinning on your UI in a small circle, but it's actually huge. It just happens to be invisible to you with the camera you happen to be looking through. So there's a lot of stuff like that where it, it gets a bit weird. Um, but conceptually, the rule is, is, is effectively that cameras don't have to look at the world. They can choose which parts of the world they see. So you could have multiple cameras with multiple perceptions of reality that layer different ways. And so most of those kinds of problems are solved the same way. In fact, it's actually the same technology used to make portals, like the way Portal does their portals. That's actually a camera. It's not, it's, it's the way it works is the when you look through it, there is a camera in the other location that is matching your motion. And all it is is putting the resulting output of that camera onto a texture and matching it so it feels like you're looking through something. What you're actually doing is looking at the result of a camera. So that's the general philosophy of how, yeah, exactly, render textures and the rest of that stuff works. It's just, it, it's something to look into if you're curious. And then we haven't even gotten into things like depth buffers where you can do really weird stuff where you end up with like, all of that. If you ever played a game called it Antimatter, I think it was. There's like a whole load of wacky effects where you can have stuff that's like pseudo 3D inside of it, or larger than where the inside is bigger than the outside, Tarda style or whatever. There's tons of stuff you can do, but it, it all boils down to camera trickery and depth drawing and how all of that stuff works. Yeah, the, you, when you mentioned that too, it reminded me of the intermediate step between my my super hacky version and the black room is the super hacky version with the camera flag set to only render the character, right? Start start there, only render the character and just have a black background or something. Uh, it also reminded me of like uh, one of the options that you have, sorry, pulling up the render texture just so everybody can see what it was and tell everybody. So when you take the extra cameras and you wanted to do it onto that UI element, this is what you use. You create a render texture, you set that as the target, and then you can use that as like the source for the image. You can do similar kind of thing for um, portals, but... What I want to talk about, um, too, on the cameras and the layers was one of the neat things that you can have just a, a whole different version of the way that the world works based on what camera is there and then have state type effects that change it, you know, swap the cameras and you can do this switch in between them and totally change the way that the world works um, and the way that everything looks and acts, I guess. It's just another just fun trick to do, I guess. I, I don't know. I just want to mention it. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, that's the thing. Is like imagine having a world where it's like the normal version and the version on fire. It could actually be on fire all the time, but it's almost like a separate dimension. One camera is looking into the second dimension. One camera is looking into the current one. And depending on which camera you turn on or off for the player, to them it looks like everything just suddenly went on fire. But it's actually it's always been that way. It's just you're only seeing the, the specific part of it that the uh, the game dev is showing you at the time. Yeah, they just couldn't see that that version of the terrain or whatever it was. Obviously, you run into performance problems, you do too much stuff, but you, and you got to think yeah. about it. But it's it's definitely a useful trick um, up to some point. So, oh, oh antichamber. How, that's that's the game. Yeah, by the way, which one? Antichamber. That's the one I was talking about. Which has that 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 game is almost like a demonstration of camera effects like that. It's specifically the game is all about showing those off. Oh, okay, I have to check it out. Um, this question popped up. How do, how often does it happen that you don't couple things? And it um, stood out to me because it's all the time. Like this happens all the time. I just have to make I make it a habit to go back and fix it afterwards. Right? It's it generally the way that I do it. So what they're talking about here is how often does it happen that you don't decouple things and pretty much just hack things together? Was the question. I, I'd even go further and say not only all the time. I would say literally every time first. The mm -hmm. first step is always to hack it together. The question is, I think the difference between experience and not is when you decide to stop 
and unhack it. <laughs> you do the hack. Everyone does the hack first. The question becomes, when do you stop? If, if you try to design architecture first, you'll fail because you'll be trying to solve problems you haven't found yet. But if you start with the problem, start with the solution, and then look at it and go, okay, this works. But if I try to work with this any further, I'll give myself a headache. It's a mess. What if I stop now and just tidy it a bit, give it a slightly better name and move it up a couple of places and then move on and do more hacks. But if you just keep doing that, it's like, it's, it's the same thing chefs say, keep your workspace clean. If you're cooking 10 kinds of meals, you will have a nightmare if you keep letting the place get dirty after each meal. But if you cook a meal, clean up after the thing you've just done, you never have to do the big kitchen clean as often because it's like, you're just focusing on cleaning as you go. So yeah, the answer is all of the time, but take the time after it works to just give it a bit of a cleanup. And if you do that reasonable and a small amount all the time, you'll you'll end up with decoupled code afterwards. That's the truth of it. It's not, you don't aim for decoupled code, you get there because you keep your code clean. Yeah, this ties so much into the next question too, which was any tips for balancing rapid prototyping and creating clean architecture? There you go, yeah. Terrible system. I feel like I'm always slowing down Speed prototyping <laughs> with architecture design. Exactly. Don't don't try to do the the design in advance. That's the problem. Or that's at least in my experience, and sounds like in Jason's. <laughs> yeah. The, the 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 answer I always say to myself, and again, these are like these are hard fought answers because I can't stress enough. I had all of these problems. I used to I used to write messes of architecture, and I used to panic over the fact that I would waste so much time, and I would be afraid of doing game jams because I would I know I'd over architect and I wouldn't get much done, and so. Mm -hmm. The, the trick is just to realize everything you do should add value. So the trick is if I'm building a thing and I wanted to shoot a bullet or do a thing, my first goal is it needs to shoot the thing. That's the, that's the thing I sat down to write. So that's the code I'll write. Architecture isn't actually progress. Architecture looks like progress, but it doesn't get you any closer to your goal. So the thing is make it do the thing it needs to do. And then when the second thing comes along, now I want it to shoot a different kind of bullet. This is where you stop. And instead of deleting the old code, you basically refactor the old code such that it supports the new requirement. And that's how architecture happens. You don't either, you don't write the super clean architecture, but you also don't blow away old code for new code because then you're just writing hacks in place all of the time and you're deleting all the progress you're making. So the trick is solve one requirement. Exactly, it has to add value. It has to make the project better. And then when you look at it the second time around, can you make your changes that add the new features without breaking what's there? As in like add to it rather than remove from it. And if you keep doing that, that's what a system is. It is a thing that has changed to support multiple requirements. It's just if you if you try not to guess in advance, I want to have 50 abilities and they all do. No, you don't. You want right now, jump. Make jump work. Then once jump works, make dash work. And by the time you get to the third or fourth one, you'll start to notice certain areas are getting a lot of heavy attention. Certain areas are not. Take the parts that have heavy attention and start to like move things in a way that make it easier to add the next thing you're adding. And then over time, that'll become a good architecture. Yeah, this is just a, a valuable, valuable advice. I mean, this is, a, I remember when you talked about the the game jam over architecting thing, it just instantly popped into my head this time when I was at a game jam with Dave. Uh, you met Dave, the British guy that was on here, um, at a game jam with him. And I think I spent the entire game jam architecting the UI event structure <laughs> and the UI callbacks. Never finished any useful part of the game at all. Just got like, oh, hey, here's a UI framework set up. Now we can bind in some stuff for UI. It's like giant waste of time. And I was like, that was it. it took, at the end of it, I was like, what did I do wrong? This seemed like it didn't yeah. work out right. It took me a while to realize like I, I didn't focus on the actual problem and just sat around trying to implement some architectural design stuff that I, I thought was See, interesting. It's funny. Fun. I, I did exactly the same thing. Only for me, it was a spawner. I was working on a system where it's like um, you, you had to solve a puzzle. You'd get random pieces and you have to put the random pieces into various bins and things. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll make a system that can support uh, mathematical weighting and you could pick X percent chance of this, this, and this. You could do all of these. And I had this huge complicated thing where you could like choose randomized weights and options and whatever. And I spent like two or two, three hours on this thing. And it's like, well, we just needed you to pick one of these three things. Like it, I could have written that in like four lines of code. And then later on, here's the real kicker. After all the effort I put in, one of the guys said, actually, I would like to be able to control it over time, like a curve in terms of like, you get a lot of them now, less of them now, whatever. 
And it's like, so the big, complicated, super clever system I wrote didn't even support the one requirement somebody asked me for as soon as it was finished. So I was like, <laughs> why did I bother guessing at all of these amazing features when the one thing that was actually needed wasn't there? So if I'd been smart going back, I would have made a thing that says, pick one of three randomly, go. And then the next time someone comes along and says, oh, I wish we could say at the start here, it goes faster. And at the end here, it's more likely to be red. I could say, I can do that. I can go in and I can make a curve and say, pick off the ratio of which one's on the curve. And that would have given me the freedom to do that later on over anything I want. But yeah, so I've, I've been there myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Heaven saw of us you just code up stuff that you're just not going to need so where the whole Yagni term came from. Uh, so there was a question about um, design patterns. So kind of going in the exact opposite direction and giving people design patterns to go slap into their game. Um, there's a question about which ones should be known. And there's a follow up about that they know. Or so the question was, which design pattern should every game dev know? And I've done a video about this, I think. But then there's a follow up. I know simple ones like singletons and state machine pattern or state patterns. Are, are there any others that are slightly as important as those or? or more important. So, I mean, for me, the number one one is always the observer pattern. You should at least understand that because it's probably the most used thing that you're going to run into. Yeah, um, I mean, especially like whenever we say events, by the way, every event is a trickle-down version of the observer pattern. The observer pattern came first. It was the thing that was named for it. And all of the delegate system, the event system, everything, the unity event system, every single one of them is just a version of the observer pattern. So if you understand the observer pattern, a lot of that stuff will be easier to, to kind of reason about. Yeah, that's that's my number one. I don't know if there's any other one that you would say they definitely should jump into. But. Um, to be honest, I'd say, well, I, well, I, I loved it. I learned all of them. Whenever I could, I would read every single one. But I, I don't, like I said, though, I'm cautious giving people advice on that because I can give you a list. I can start going, oh, learn flyweight and mediator. And I can go down a whole big thing. And it's like, I don't think that's valuable to people. I don't think learning patterns is because patterns are there to solve problems. And I find it's like, I, th I think we all know this. We all have a friend who gets into a new hobby and the first thing they do is buy all of the most expensive kit and equipment. And we've talked about both of us have been guilty of doing that before in the past. And like, are you really helping your friend? If your friend comes to you and says, hey, I'm getting into computers and I want to like write some emails on my on a laptop when I'm in the coffee shop. And you're like, okay, well, you're going to need a top top tier gaming machine, right? You're gonna need <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> obviously not, right? So I look at it and I go, there are tools out there that are really specialized that do some really cool stuff. There's like really valuable reasons to use the flyweight pattern, or there's the component model architecture, which is what Unity is using for you. It's already doing that. It's already taking part of all the complexities of managing the, the interaction of components. Um, and you can learn these and you can use them. But I find you're better off having a problem, Googling how to solve the problem, and then finding a pattern comes up a lot relative to the problem you have, and then learning that pattern in situ when it directly applies. Because then you'll apply it to the problem and go, oh, okay, this is why it exists. If I just give you a sea of patterns, what you'll do is you'll just run around with your cool pile of tools looking for any excuse to use them. Anything that comes up, can, can I put it, can I use a hammer on that? Can I use a, where can I, and that doesn't, that'll, that'll make your code worse. Every time it'll make your code worse. You're just better off not pre-stocking your your collection of tools because you will you'll get bad habits from that. You're better off just going going about your day, picking problems, picking stuff you want to solve, and then going on an adventure. Ask, go online and find ten different people telling you different ways to build a stat system, and you'll start to see certain patterns emerge. There's a lot of strategies. There's a lot of various other things coming up, and you're like, oh, okay, so maybe these patterns are worth looking into for this kind of problem, or you know. Yeah, and then once you find those, you want to look into what the actual pattern is, like the flyweight pattern, right? So you're trying to save, you go through a bunch of different examples of how to build an inventory system or some other type of data system, and you get, you know, you, you, you start to see it repetitively. You want to dive in and kind of learn what that pattern is, understand how you're using it. And same with events. As soon as you're using events, if you're using just C-sharp events, action events, uh, Unity events, you should do a little bit of research into the observer pattern. Watch a couple of videos on what the observer pattern is. You see that it's very similar in every language. It's, you're just using another implementation of it. And you get kind of a better understanding of how it's working under the hood. Like how does an event 
magically just send off a thing to all the things listening and how does it how does it know how does that work you can learn that mm -hmm. all really easily because the code behind it that, that they're abstracting away isn't very complicated also the patterns tend to stack right like or they tend to solve related but different problems like you would learn the observer and you're like okay i get this i i can now have a thing have observable information the, the example i use is a phone number it's like if you if you if your friend works at gamestop and he's got He's got the updates when the new PS5s come in. You can give him your phone number and he'll call you to let you know the new PS5s are in. That's an observer. You're basically saying you are you are giving him your phone number and saying, let me know when this happens. And that's great. But what if you don't have a friend at GameStop? How do you find out information? Well, wouldn't it be cool if there was some notice board or Twitter group or something you could subscribe to that would tell you? Well, now you're getting into something called an event bus and the mediator. But the thing is, if you go down that road to learn these off the top of their head, they won't add value to you. But if you instead have a problem, research solving the problem, learn the appropriate patterns to match it, you'll you'll find that it's like these things stack. So like I said, it goes from observer, maybe up to mediator. Maybe from there you start getting into things like having uh, the full event bus system with topics and all sorts of other crazy stuff on top of that. So it's, yeah, just wait and solve problems <laughs> basically don't don't jump too far ahead don't pre-solve them all don't don't uh, what i used to love to do was pre-solve my problems at a user group as soon as i found out about a new tech and find like okay this is gonna solve all of these problems it always worked out great <laughs> okay that's why my, my biggest oh sorry go, on. go ahead no go ahead I was just going to say, this is why, like, in a career of working with people who have different fra different phases of their career, there's certain red flags that are kind of like, I can sense where you are in your career, and this particular one is a red flag to me. And the one that always clearly indicates to me is when somebody starts building their own um, sort of, like, code editor tool. Like, if someone is writing a tool to allow them to uh, make systems without writing code... And basically building their own, you know, node systems or graph tools or whatever. I'm going to stop and say, uh oh, you've hit that phase of your career where you're enjoying writing the code more than you enjoy actually making anything valuable. And so what you're going to do is you're going to waste the next six months building tools that are really fun to make because they're fun to make. And then you're going to show everybody proudly that you made this really clever system that does all sorts of cool magical stuff that hooks things up together. And nobody will want to use it because you've basically made a solution with no problem. And all you've done is you've made a tool that's very specifically fun to play with, that fun to make but literally nobody asked for and solves no problems. And you'll be really bummed out when you show it to everybody and nobody's as excited as you were because of how much stuff you learned to make it. And that's like, I can see that entire journey someone's about to go through the minute someone's like, oh, I built a little editor tool and I can make commands and I can stack things together and I can use components to do conditionals. And it's like, you're not solving anything. You're just playing. You're, you're, you're having fun and that's fine, but you're going to be really disappointed when <laughs> you realize this isn't actually valuable to most of what you're doing. I, I remember that experience many times over and seeing not, not just myself, but I saw a lot of other developers that I worked with do the exact same thing. It wasn't like, it wasn't just me. I can think of many, many tools and things that got started up because they were going to be so awesome and they'd have a blast working on them and then never go anywhere because uh, my, my version of that, the, the most problem. I, I did loads of those from uh, behavior processing systems to writing my own DSL languages to everything. But the one that really sticks out to me is just pointlessly stupid. I built a modular system that allows me to add mathematic operations to any object type. So I could take anything and add plus, minus, divide, multiply, and whatever. For an example of this, I built a system I was so proud of, I could make a class called car, I could make a class called bike, and I could add two bikes together to get a car, and I could add two cars together to get a bus, and I could add two buses together to get a train. And it served no purpose. It was really cool. I could conceptually take any object type and have it scale, divide, multiply by using this abstract generic. Like you, you choose what's one entity version of it. You had it. It'll do all of the work for you to support all the mathematical operations. But why? <laughs> it was really, like, I was they're just not so useful stupid. mathematical operations, but they're done, damn. <laughs> yeah, it's just it was just one of those like I was really enjoying the idea. I think I started with building like a weighting system, and I originally made it with ints, and then I was like, okay, let's make it with floats because I want to have like float weights in certain places and int weights in other places. And I was like, ah, I have to keep writing the same code because I can't just generically say 
add whatever one unit of U is, and it said, wait a minute, what if I could solve it for all things ever? All floats, and ints, and doubles, and whatever. And so I built this really over-the-top problem that, again, didn't do anything. And then after all of that, I learn about the differences between you know boxing and performance, and I'm like, oh, cool. So not only did the thing I write not solve my problem, it's actually way worse for performance to the point where it's not even worth using. I should have just duplicated the code and written the int version and the float version. It would have been a million times faster, smaller code, would have worked better, and yeah. Yeah, Lessons without learned. killing performance for no benefit. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you there. Uh, that's, that's great. It's always nice to hear that like other people are making the same, uh, <laughs> yeah. the same mistakes as, as I am. Um, there was a there was a question. I want to real quickly. There was one up above. I almost missed about C plus plus. How to learn C plus plus? I have no idea anymore. It's been so long since I did any C plus plus learning stuff. Um, I don't know if you have any advice for that. If not, I'm just going to jump on to the next one. But. I, I, I would just say I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much. This is one of those things. Like I've had people say, "What language should I start with?" Or if I do start with language, how do I learn other languages? The truth is, learn a programming language. If you can comfortably learn one language, you can learn other languages. Like most, especially object-oriented languages. If if you if you take the three four years it takes to get good at Java or C sharp or whatever, the next language might take you a year. The next language might take you a month, and after that, you're probably looking at a, a couple of weeks to a month per language to kind of get reasonably competent at it. So, I wouldn't I wouldn't like for example, I read the book Game AI by Example. Um, Buckland, I think, and that game that was that book is entirely written in C plus plus. At the time, I didn't read C plus plus, but I could look at it. I could read what he was saying. I could kind of roughly understand the syntax. I could could never write it, but I could understand it enough to transcribe it to C sharp. And so most people could do that. If you understand the logic of what's going on, the syntax is just learning the right dot or dash or slash or whatever at the right time. So. Yeah, I do the same with uh, Java. A lot of the old books um, that were on design patterns were all in Java, and my Java skills were... I and just never really used it professionally. But it's still be able to translate it, because once you get used to the patterns and the structure of stuff, it gets relatively easy. What I would recommend, and if you're in that scenario, though, and you get a little bit stuck, just go start looking up what the the primary operators are and stuff for the language, a little bit of the syntax, and you'll be able to tear right through it. Now, if you need it specifically for something, though, like you've got a job that requires C++, you're getting into Unreal programming or something else, um, I still don't know the best advice on how to how to learn that specific language. Um, I... I wish, yeah, I, I wish I did. The resources keep changing. This is the this is the problem with doing it for like 10, 15 years is that I used to go, oh, just watch the 3D Buzz stuff. Oh, they're all offline now. Okay, just watch the lynda.com. Oh, lynda.com doesn't really do the same stuff anymore. Okay, go to Plural Site. Okay, but a lot of those courses are like eight years old. So there's every resource I used to go to is all stuff that's like mostly. Well, you already getting, learned it, right? So you're not going back and learning from the, the latest and yeah. greatest stuff. So it's, it's kind of hard to know. And I'm in the yeah. same boat. It's, like I said, it's a long time since I had to dive into learning C++ stuff. Um, so here was a question that I thought, again, would be interesting for you, which was, I want to find a game dev job. I'm in a country where there's almost no game dev scene. Any place you'd recommend to start applying for jobs? I This is one I always struggle with because there's just game dev jobs like falling out everywhere here. I mean, there's, yeah, there's zero here. Literally. So, yeah. But I mean, I know you're in a place where there's quite a few less you know i mean you're yeah. still not in a place where there's none because ireland's still relatively good for development but i mean do you have any I, advice? I will say though that the one problem with development in ireland is ireland have a lot of their a lot of games companies use ireland as a tax haven so they have large offices here but all they do is hire them out for predominantly uh, call center work so there's a, if you wanted to do like voice call center stuff for mmos or whatever there's a lot of that here in ireland but in terms of actual game dev work here most of it's actually not there so it's a bit deceptive there is we still produce a lot of software but it's mostly enterprise software in game development even though there's a lot of game studios in ireland very few of them actually produce the games in ireland which is a bit of a bummer so yeah oh i didn't realize problem. that hmm. so is there a place that you generally recommend also if anybody in chat has recommendations too because mm. people from all over the world um drop them in chat too and just just share but anything you'd recommend well, I would say, well, first of all, you have to draw a line between what kind of work do you want to do. Do you want to work on AAA titles or do you want to make games? Because honestly, I think they're two very different things. You, there's a different adventure you go on if you want to like be a cog in someone else's wheel, which I'm not even saying that is a bad thing. I'm saying that like it's really cool to be a name on that giant list of epic games. But at the same time, that's a different thing. You, you're, you have to go a different path and pay your dues and do testing and all the other stuff up that pipeline or... 
if you want to make games or hypothetically potentially make your own studio or work with your friends, that's a different one. That's just like get the tools and make it yourself, right? There's a different there's a there's a different relationship there. So it depends what you want. I would say in general though, the truth is it's all about who you know. Most things are, and you get to know more people the more communities you're in. So I say the same thing every time. I may be in Ireland, I may be middle of nowhere but I'm relatively prolific online. There's a lot of communities I join. I mod in them. I, I talk to people. I hang out. I DM people when I think I can help them on projects. And you just start to make contacts. That's just how it works. So there's no place. There's no specific thing. I just think there's enough... Like, people who are game devs who like games like the same kind of stuff you do if you like games. And so you'll find them in the same places. They'll be in the same community. There's lots of... Like, people look at GMTK, for example, that YouTube channel, and go, oh yeah, this is really interesting because I want to learn how to make games and whatever. But a lot of game devs also watch that channel because it's a really cool place to see game-related stuff. And so you may not realize it, there's probably a lot of lurking game devs on titles you don't know about in the communities you're in. So you'll eventually just get to meet these people if you hang out long enough and sort of, you know, get to know them. Yeah. Yeah, I think the knowing people is by far the best way to get a job. It's how I've gotten probably at least half jobs that i got maybe more i don't know just from somebody recommending hey you should come work here or you should go work there um but for apply yeah and i would recommend just going out and actually starting to apply for things now where the hard part is like when you actually want to get paid for it though to to do it as a living and there aren't any any options in the country i really don't know how you find like international remote contracts personally um I assume there's some way to do it other than through contract contacts. Like I know people who occasionally pop up and have con contracts that they're trying to hire for that are international and they don't care where it is or they're here and they don't care where you are. They just want to hire somebody. But uh, I don't know of any like great places that just constantly have a listing yeah. like that. Like I like the Gamma Sutra jobs page. It's okay. It's free and it's, it's somewhat dead now, but it still has some stuff on there. And then uh, I always like the cyber coders page was always a really good one for game dev jobs. But those are, I think, just in the U.S. I mean, yeah, the, the problem Sutra is, has uh, that stuff outside the U.S. Yeah, I think much. the problem is as well is that it's, it's people don't like to, to kind of hear it. But the fact is, game dev is a pretty desirable job, right? At the end of the day, it's a kind of a fun thing to do. And a lot of people, I'm not saying it's super easy. There are issues. But the thing is, it's very... Um, it's very dramatized. People have a rosy-eyed view that game dev is get to play games all day and there's no work involved. And so the desire for people who want the job far outweighs the number of needed jobs in those areas. And so usually there's not just going to be a place you can go to. There's no, there's nobody just handing out game dev jobs if you find the right spot and you're missing some secret fountain of game dev jobs that no one's telling you about. The truth is people tend to hire for a certain skill. They are making a game and they need someone who can make Pixar-like art, or they're making a game and they need someone who can do a character controller that feels like Sonic. There's usually a thing that they want and they look for it and they find somebody with that skill. So the the truth is, rather than like try to find the job, because I'm I'm you know you probably won't if I'm being honest, it's very hard to find that job. But if you have an online portfolio of stuff that proves you can do character controllers like that or models like that or you've made or some VR other controllers game. right like yeah i mean i've hired people, people just because they have vr headsets and some experience with that mm -hmm. and they can do the basics with that right but, yeah I've, I've literally reached out to people who posted on twitter some you know showcase thing they've done and i said that's cool are you available to hire i liked your thing I, you can clearly do stuff like this i need stuff like this for a project so the truth is just make things like that's just the unfortunate the, the thing is make stuff and show it to people. I've got one, uh, one bonus piece of advice and I'm going to use this for my tip of the week too. <laughs> this is an extra one because one that I'd I had forgotten about, I've been, no, wanting to, tip <laughs> I've been wanting to talk about for a while. And, um, it's, something that they kind of big that changed and happened. Um, before I do though, everybody hit the like button and share and stuff. Cause this is going to be, um, really, really exciting for me at least. So I don't know if you remember the unity connect stuff. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Everybody here, if you haven't used it, it was this whole basically like unity making their own social media platform, right? They made their own version of Google plus or whatever. Well, that's right? what that link was the one I sent earlier. That was a connect blog article thing. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. And it's, and they basically killed it now, right? They've pretty yeah, much killed it. It was like a job oh, site yeah. and a, it was never really, 
I don't know. It, it always felt like Google Plus to me, right? Like it was this thing that was like kind of there and you could go use it, but like you didn't really know why you were there to use it other than maybe to go look for some jobs and stuff. They have killed it, but they brought back the one thing that made me sad about Connect, which was when they brought Connect out, they killed the Unity job forums and they brought it back. So it's up here oh, now. Man. And this is actually one of the places I would recommend looking. This is the job offering. There's also a job seeking one. If you have skills that you can show off, like Jason was talking about, go post them in the job seeking. Go look at some of the better posts there and post it up there. But if you're looking to find a job, um, I have definitely hired from here before. I know multiple people who have hired from these job forums, and it looks like it's relatively active. I mean, it's not super, super busy, but there's posts as of, um, what, today, yesterday? So I, I would definitely take a look at this. My guess is that this thing will probably start to start to build up and start to just get more and more popular again because it was really popular before they killed it with Unity Connect and they added the whole job listing thing to it. So I just expect that this is just going to keep growing and being a good place. And it's free, it's open, and it's just, yeah. It's my tip. I recommend you go check it out if you're looking for a job. <laughs> have you used this thing before, the, uh, the job forms? I assume um, you have, right? No, actually, no, I haven't. Um, oh. So, like I said, the, the, I'm in a weird enough position where I haven't actually applied for a Unity job in... I don't think I've ever applied for a Unity job. Oh. I, I think what's happened is in almost every single case, I've had somebody who's reached out to me because of a forum or some post, or I helped them on a thread, or I met them in a community, or I was recommended by a friend of a friend because they know that I'm into X topic or whatever. And so... I often have people DM me now and I just sort of like, I've turned down three different jobs in the last week alone. So it's, it just, if, if you make a portfolio around that, people come to you for it. And as for hiring, it's the same as I was saying, the inverse is that I don't trust going on a random hunt for people. Normally I'm in enough communities with enough passionate people that if I find like, for example, I, there is a job that I have been looking for for somebody. Well, not me personally. A company I work with is trying to hire somebody and they want me to train them. And they like, where would I post that job? I could post it here. I could go down this road. Or I'm in a bunch of communities where I know the people. I can post it in there. And I'm like, I, I know I'm in a, I've already like sub vetted this community by the nature of being here for a year, hanging out with these people. And I kind of get a sense of who can do what. And so there's no reason for me to sort of reach out into the wild when I can sort of cultivate groups of people that I know um, are good at certain topics. So I, I tend not to, again, I'm not saying these are bad things. I'm just saying that from my right. experience, communities tend to um, grow insularly around similar topics. So I find that most people I know hire me through that approach or I hire them through that approach as well. I, I find it's very hard to break in. And that's why I say meet people because this is very much like throwing your name out into the ocean and hoping somebody picks it up as opposed to finding a small swimming pool, <laughs> jumping in, right? Where there's people who are all thematically and interested in the same thing and you demonstrate your value in that area, you know? Yeah, I think that that's right. And, but in this, on this forum, like it is, I, I think it's still, a, a, let, me, let me get my words straight. I'm talking, <laughs> get, get all stuck here. Um, uh, I, I think that the community thing is by far the best. Uh, I just want to clarify. So like, I also in this kind of same boat where every job I find out about comes from somebody. And almost always, I just go to somebody in a community that I know, somebody that either I've taught stuff to or has taught me stuff before that I talked to in the past. Um, but for people who don't have any community and stuff, I think that this is definitely something that I've used in the past. And I'm just kind of looking through and looking at some of the the postings here there really aren't very many for like programmers or a decent number of artist ones and and music stuff but i get the sense that if you posted a c-sharp programming position or like that you were a programmer here with some of your experience and this and you know an actual portfolio of what you had you'd probably get a good number of actual people interested that said though you're probably going to get like you know eight, eight out of the ten are probably going to be Hey, do you want to come work on this for a hundred dollars a month, you know, or whatever, or like for free and we'll give you three percent of the game when it's done, you know. So you gotta watch out for those, but you will find some actual really good positions. Like, um, I don't know if have you ever met Kyle, Jason? You may not have met my my buddy Kyle. I worked on a couple games with him before. 
And the first time that um, he started working with us was actually through here. He had posted on the Unity forums. I mean, this was a long time ago, like not 12 years ago or something. But he, I think he had posted on here or we had posted a job opening, one of the two. And then he got back to my friend who was the producer at the time. And they talked and he was like an amazing fit, amazing programmer. And he was like 19, <laughs> like amazing, like 19 year old programmer. Got a great job working from home, um, building games at, at a real game dev salary. And I've seen that multiple times over for people on here where they just were good at it. They were interested in what they did and they found positions on here. And I know he had found a lot of other jobs on here too. And a lot of other people have to. I've even posted on here and taken up some contracts. I had forgotten about that. I've actually done like, I think three or four different contracts from Ooh. posting on here that I was looking for work um, in my earlier Unity days, kind of in between jobs when just not working on stuff and posted and found some stuff. So I should keep a link definitely. to this anyway. I get a lot of people asking me basically that question. How do I, how do I find work in Unity? So I should probably keep this on hand to, to throw at people and say, there you go. <laughs> I was looking at that. I've just got to remember that it exists because they killed it. Like it was like my number one like thing. I'd like say, go to that, go to Gamma Sutra and Cyber Coders. And then they killed it. And now it's back. And I've just got to remember that it's back because it's super handy. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll jump on to another question. So, ooh, this one's interesting and very, very global. So, there are so many systems and tools available on the asset store. Any advice on how much I should try to build myself versus buying on the asset store? I love this question. Uh, you go first because I, I have a big rant ready for this one. Good, good. <laughs> um, my general rule is that I buy things on the asset store when they solve a problem that's not the key part of my game. It's not like the core part of my game. And it's going to be not nearly as cost effective for me to just build it myself. If it's going to take me, you know, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at the cost. The cost of the thing on the asset isn't so much the problem because they're almost always low enough that it, if it's an actual commercial project, it doesn't matter. I look at more of the, the time cost of it. Like how, how long is it going to take for me to integrate this thing? Is it actually going to save me time over the long run? Or am I going to have to learn a whole new system? find all of the weird bugs with it, integrate them and fix them and then deal with updates to it? Or, or is, can I just kind of build a simple version of this on my own in a, in a much shorter amount of time? If that's the case, then I'll build it on my own. But in general, um, again, if it's not a core piece of my game, it's a, a, a secondary part of it, and it's something that I can save a bunch of time on by just buying, I will almost always do that. Not... The thing is, though, it's very rare that I end up buying actual code, right? <laughs> like, I, I realize, like, I very rarely end up buying, like, an actual game system. It's more like... Well, well sometimes, sometimes I buy it to peek under the hood, system. but I wouldn't use it. <laughs> What's that? Sometimes I'd buy it to, like, look at it to see oh. how they did it, but I wouldn't use it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, and that's the case. Because generally, like, if you're buying people's code assets and they're not, like, a library that's kind of slapping on top of something like a Dootween or a UI kit type library, something that's changing out Know, some functionality or adding stuff and it's actually really opinionated it just gets to be a pain in the ass to work with and to integrate it with your own systems and then make it kind of work with theirs so i i mm. say i buy a lot of like third party or like external editor tools um things like tweening tools i really like or and and then things that solve specific problems, special water stuff, slicing of meshes, breaking of buildings, all that kind of stuff. Like, unless I, you know, it's the main thing that I need to focus on, I don't want to be building that myself. And a lot of the time, the systems are just there and they're better than the things that I could build myself in any reasonable amount of time as well. I think of like a building destruction. Like, I don't want to build my own building destruction setup. I can use one of the existing ones unless I run into a very specific need. But most of the time, those big systems that are fully supported, where it's like doing one big thing really, really well, they they tend to do it really well, right? They, they hit the edge cases and handle that. Like if I was building a racing game, one thing I would consider is maybe using a racing physics setup, right? Because they're actually decent. They're, it's going to get me 95, 99% of where I want to go and probably do a better job than I would without spending a year mm -hmm. researching the best ways to build a, an actual accurate racing Racing Plus, somebody, right. somebody's been thinking about that problem for two years. Well, you've been yeah. thinking about that problem like just for a few minutes recently. Yeah. 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 
So, so here's, here's, my, right. here's my rant on this subject, because th- this one I always find very funny. I think questions like these, a lot, of, so we talked before about how um, there's like a common contract between certain systems. Well, I, I think it's the same with questions. There's a common contract between certain questions. And this question is actually one of 50 questions we get a lot wrapped in a slightly different skin. Well, it's the same question. And it's when should I do it versus when should I buy it? That's just a general philosophy across most things. Um, and I would say that what's funny about this is it's actually pretty intuitive if you take it out of code. Because you're looking at it in code and your brain kind of goes to, well, I am a programmer, so I should be programming, so I should be doing my own stuff. But if you apply this logic to any other part of your life, it suddenly becomes a much easier question. If your friend comes up to you and says, so I'm decorating my office, should I paint a painting or buy a painting? It's like, what kind of question is that? Do you want to paint a painting or do you want to de- decorate your office? Like, what, what are you, what's your goal? Are you trying to make paint or are you trying to decorate an office? If you're trying to decorate an office, find art you like and use it. If you're trying to learn to paint, paint. They're completely unrelated and silly questions. Now, imagine someone with the same thing about cooking. They're like, so I want to cook this chicken. Should I build an oven or should I buy a new, you know, stove? Or like, like what is, these questions are silly. If you take a single step back and ask yourself what you're really saying, what you're really saying is, should I X or Y? Should I buy or should I make it? Well, what what are you trying to do? Are you trying to if you if you're trying to make a game, spend your energy making your game. Buy the pieces of the Lego blocks that make you make your game, and you can focus on the bit that's your game. If you're trying to learn how a system works, learn to make it. That's a different thing. The objective is different. The goal is different. The reason you do it is different. So they're not. It's not really um. A question for me about whether I should buy an asset or whether I should make a thing. Because if I want to learn how something works, I'll learn how to make it. If I'm solving a project for a client, I will buy a thing that does it. And if the thing that does it doesn't solve the problem I need, I will learn how it works and make it the way I need it to work, right? It's 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 a kind of intuitive thing after a while once you sort of step back and realize it's all objective driven. Like if you if you really reason about what you're trying to do, pretty much any question along these lines is easy enough to answer, you know? Yeah, it's something if people ask this a lot. So, super common. Let's let's jump on. This one was about Inkle. So, have you used Inkle? I, I think game all of our crew at this stage unit? for like everything. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. I, th- I think you, me, Chris, a lot of people we use it on pretty much tons of stuff these days. Yes. So we've definitely used it. So Ink, Inky, and Inkle really great tools for dialogue and some flow control. I have not, however, used their prototype Unity pattern as an alternative to standard prefab workflows. And I don't think that I very, would be very likely to do that. Um, putting all of my game logic into something that's not the game engine that I'm using doesn't feel necessarily good to me. Um, and I don't see a lot of a benefit from it and a lot of drawbacks because all of the things that I want to do now, I have to deal with um, after add in some la- layer mm. wrapper. Well, I, I probably used to agree with that, but once I started using FMOD more and realized that completely decoupling Unity from audio has been such a powerful like game changer for how I use audio and Unity, I'm more open to the idea. I still don't want to do it for the same reason that you said. You said something earlier that is, is exactly the word in my head too, which is opinionated. When an asset is opinionated, it basically says, in order to use this asset, you have to do it my way, not yours. It's like, well, the question is, do I want to re-architect my project support your solution? So an example of this used to be rewired. Rewired was the best input thing for Unity for a while after C input. And the question becomes, if you use it, you kind of have to lean into the way it does things. You have to do the maps. You have to do the actions. You have to do it their way. And if you do, you get tons of benefits. You get all of the cross support, all the stuff. But you, you, you can't just do input the way you would do it. You have to do it their way. And so that's your trade-off. You're, you're, it's, it's opinionated, but it's powerful. And same with the new input system, same with the you know various other systems. The question becomes, where's the trade-off? Is it too opinionated that it gets in your way? Or is it powerful enough that it outweighs those costs? And I find possibly with taking like almost all of your flow control logic out of your game engine, that's probably too opinionated for my liking. But using it to give you events and systems into it, that I could probably deal with. So it's really balancing that act in terms of how much control you want to give up to a third-party system. Yeah, for me, it's the same. Man. Just I've, I feel weird moving things out. I've done it before in the past with other games, 
you had stuff that was very separate from the engine controlling big parts and just never really felt right it always felt like an extra layer of complexity and confusion when we're getting around to actually fixing things and making the game work um there's a question about what to do when things aren't working right. So what do you do if systems like addressables don't work the way that you think they do from the documentation? Or how do you figure out what went wrong? Like why it's taking too long to download an asset or whatever else is going wrong with it. So say like you're, you're using something and it's not working the way that you expect it to work. Um, I, I don't know. Do you have some like standard things that you do with that? Or yeah, do you... no, normally I am. Um, I hyperventilate. I panic. I uh, go to bed early. I kind of give up. I get depressed for a few days. That's the usual, usual strategy. When something like that happens. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's always a good one. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or freak out and start yelling at people about how terrible their thing is and it doesn't work and it doesn't do the right yeah. thing. Yeah. I, I do a lot of those. And then, um, <laughs> oh man. And, and then uh, I usually often start off a new project. So I'll take whatever the thing is, the problem that I have, and I will create a brand new project out of it. And I'll use that new thing, the thing that's giving me the problems, it's not working right, like the documentation says, and I'll recreate it fresh in an empty project. And not every time, but probably 75 to 80% of the time, I'll realize that it was just a mistake in my implementation. Because I'll go through it, it'll work totally fine in the in the empty project, and then I'll realize there was something else that I wasn't thinking about that was causing it, that was interacting with the system, turning off an an, an object, or turning off a component, or changing some other variable, or disconnecting my network even somehow. And then I'll realize that that was the problem, and it wasn't actually the that thing. That is often the case. Yeah, it, yeah. it's normally it's the, it's the integration stuff that tends to cause you problems. So for me personally, when I'm trying to solve something like this, <clears throat> I split it into two problems. One is my current goal of I just need this damn thing to work. And two, this is a proposed solution, which is currently giving me trouble. Will it take more time or will it help me out? And so the way I tend to solve this is I will draw a boundary line. So say, for example, why are you using an addressable system? Well, you're probably using an addressable system because you want to load scenes or save data or something. So I will draw a line there and I will say thing that loads or things that saves, save. And I will then write my code kind of wrapped around the thing that's currently not working for me. And then I will do what Jason said. I will take that into a separate project and I will just test my assumptions. If I do the most basic, basic thing, does it still do what I expect or not? So is it breaking in my scene because of other stuff or is it just breaking because I don't understand it well enough or there's some part of it that's not working or whatever? And the reason I do both steps is because if I do find the solution, I can just hit a switch, get it working, we're good. If I can't find a solution, I've drawn a contract between my code and the rest of everything else. And so I can say, you know what? I'm just going to put something else here instead. It would have been nice if I got addressables working, but if it's currently stopping me from getting work done and it's too hard to figure out and it's giving me a headache and I'm not sleeping well because it's stressing me out, I will just like use some scriptable object version of it, or I will use some really basic file loader or something. So ask yourself what the system is for. What problem is it solving? And if you can't get the thing you're trying to do working, pick a simpler solution. So ideally, you'd have the real version working, but if you can't, you can use something else. So I'd say give yourself the freedom for both. One, simplify the problem, try to solve it simply. And if that doesn't work, give yourself an out by being able to connect something easier <laughs> to the system instead. So that'll be my go-to. And if it still doesn't work in the sample, you can always submit it as a bug report too. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, like honestly, like it's not often, and this is the other thing too, for the whole Occam's razor thing. Let's be honest, you'll often think, oh, this API doesn't work as expected. I better go contact the devs. I have done that so many times. And then within like, within minutes of me sending in a report, it goes, oh, I'm an idiot. I, I like left the string blank or I forgot to connect the thing or I didn't read the documentation and call the initialize function or something stupid. And so I would say always take a breath first, try it out, double check. Then if it's still a problem, you can send the bug report. Now, sometimes it is, and it's, it's very kind of refreshing when it's not your fault. It's actually something else. But Occam's razor is it's probably your fault <laughs> more so than the yeah. bug report, more like, more like than not. Most of the time, yeah. I know I, I got into that habit where I submitted so many of them so too early on that weren't actually bugs that I kind of got out of I was like, I'm just not going to do it. I was like, I'm probably wrong here. 
Um, but I, I know a couple of people who regularly just find and submit bugs in Unity and they get little rewards for it. So it's, uh, it's definitely a thing, but yeah, <laughs> separate stuff out. All right. Um, do you want to jump on to more questions or do you want to talk about anything specific? That, I don't know if there's anything you really I'm want good. to talk about. Um, Go over a couple more. Want to know whether or not yeah. Java is good for game development? I mean, I would made no. a millionaire or whatever. <laughs> Does what, it, yeah. does what it needs, I guess. Yeah, it's it, it's. Oh, you could make a game in it, but and if you're good at oh, Java, yeah. so you could you make a game in it? You could Probably make, not. You know, no, I wouldn't recommend it as like yeah. if you want to be a game developer. I wouldn't recommend Java as the way to go. Go with C plus plus or C sharp. Um, you learn Unity or Unreal, one of the two. Yeah, like like the truth is, from from the highest like polite answer is use anything you like. Whatever makes you make a game, use it. But if we're being practical, make your life easier. If you're using something like Java, that most people even even if it wasn't a bit slow for game development, even if was, even if that wasn't an issue, even if it was really fast, ask yourself if the lack of resources is worth it. You're living in a world where you have to be one of the few thousand people trying to learn how to make a game in Java, or you can go use something else like C Sharp or Unreal or or you know Mono or whatever else you want to use, and like there's millions of resources out there for you. So the short answer is use the thing that will make it easier for you when you eventually hit a brick wall. Have the most resources, the most online stuff, the most help, and it'll just make your life easier. Yeah. And I would say Java is probably not that in a game development context. Right. Again, unless you happen to be, you know, you really love Java and, and you're stuck with it. I don't know. So this one was interesting. It was, was about our, our talking about iteration. I, I just had to bring it up. So Ryan said, not to be rude, That's but true. what you're all basically saying is to think like a simpleton, develop like a lazy person, and iterate like Einstein. I think that's perfect. Yes. Yep. Develop like a lazy person, minimize the amount of preparation and all that other stuff, and then iterate and iterate and make it better. Fix it. Yeah. I, I just like so, <laughs> Yeah, like the, the, way, the way I've phrased this in the past, which is similar, is to say that like people look at code and because it's all computery and computers read it, they think it's for computers. Code isn't for computers. As we've established before, computers speak in, you know, assembly and binary and they don't speak <laughs> in, yeah, if thing does thing, do other thing. That's for humans. That The reason we write programming languages, whether it's Java or C Sharp or whatever, is the whole point of it is in, it's encapsulating intent. The entire point of all programming languages is to take a thing out of your head in a conceptual way, turn it into rules that a computer can understand. And so programming languages are actually for us. They're for developers to talk to other developers to, to figure out how to ask a computer questions. And so honestly, code should read like the things in your head because that's what they're for. The point of code is to say, if they have enough money in their account, and they're the right class, and they go to the shop, and they want to buy the thing, and they buy the thing, they get the thing. Like, if your code can read as close to that sentence, <laughs> then you end up with this beautiful world where your code just reads like it's supposed to do. Now, you have to take some corners when there's performance concerns, other stuff. But as a general rule, yes, start by writing your code like you're just describing in very careful language everything you want your application to do. And then at a certain point, you might have to make concessions later and optimize certain paths and whatever. But start by encapsulating your intent. Because once your intent is on the page, it's easy to optimize it. If you start with this hyper-optimized mess of nonsense keywords and memory blipping and doing all sorts of stuff, like how the hell are you supposed to fix or change that if the original intent isn't even on the page, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Uh, and the whole thing about code being human readable uh, that's again the main thing that matters that's why sometimes when I, mean, I hear people say like write it as short as you can i get a little bit worried that somebody's going to think that that means like shove as much into as yeah. little characters Start using and lines four ternaries possible. in a row or whatever it's yeah. like ugh. like yeah. they got all their variables named a b and c to shorten it down even more like make it as short as possible to read easily <laughs> it's always like Short but very readable. Readability is more important than than terseness. Mm. The, the way the way I use it is every word should have intent or value. Why did you write that word in that system? So I used to write thing repository a lot or thing controller or thing manager. And I realized that if you've got 
say stats, you've got a stat system and you've got individual stats and then you've got a stat manager. Now, yes, the stat manager manages stats, but if you had a thing called stat and then a thing called stats, would are you losing any information there? Stats.do thing, stat manager dot do thing. It's pretty much like you're talking to the stats, right? Like so I find that there's a lot of words that aren't actually adding value to something. Now there's a difference when it's domain knowledge. So character and character controller are actually different things. They mean something. So there's a different value to that word in the context of game development. In the same way, a character motor would imply something different than a character animator. And so I'm not saying the words themselves shouldn't be used. I'm saying if the word itself isn't helping you understand the job or the role or the thing this thing does, do you need to end your objects with object? Do you need to end your, you know, weapons with weapon at the end of every word? And suddenly, like, think about it. If you've got gun weapon or weapon gun, how many times are you going to have to see the word weapon in that page? Weapon gun, weapon equals weapon gun, weapon dot weapon dot do it. Like, what you're really saying is gun dot shoot. Like, does all of that other weapon stuff make it easier to understand or easier to read? Probably not. So it can be short, but it has to make sense. So I like to read it and go, can I understand that? Is there is there missing information or context? Or is there too much information or context? And I try to distill it down into intent. That's the word. It's like, does this describe if has no ammo, ammo load, gun, if can shoot, shoot gun? Like, does it read with the intent of my objectives as a programmer? That's, I think, the most important thing. It's the best way to have code that you can share with other people and actually maintain and, and manage. If your code is easy to read and easy to understand, it's a whole lot easier to add to and not break, right? And not, not turn into a giant mess. So there was a question about splines. Is um, We're falling a bit behind on them, but about um, racing games and splines and mm-hmm. mentioning it in the past. Um I don't remember if you had talked about that or I had talked about that. Do you have any good resources on this that we could share with them? Um, I'm not sure if something that comes to mind, except maybe there's that website, Cat Like Coding. There's some yeah. tutorials on there. There's a really great series on that, on making your own editor tools to create your own spline system that lets you create a spline in the inspector view, uh, in the editor view, and then once you've made it in the scene, you can interact with it. Um, to be more specific about the question where it says calculate positions in a racing game, well, so if you think about it from a racing game perspective, if you have a spline, just any shape, a spline is actually just a collection of points. The, the, the kind of the curvy bits in between don't actually exist. They're interpolated from the points. So technically you've got the two points, you add a third point, and then you can curve using the third point against the two points. And so if you if you step away from spline for a second and realize what you're saying is, I have a collection of points, what you're really saying is I have a collection of waypoints that I want my racing game character to move along, my ship or my car or whatever. And so all you have to do is take the points and, back to a previous conversation, interpolate between them. So if you go to the LERP stuff, all you do is you take your character position, set it at the first point, and then over whatever time or as they press up or as accelerate as acceleration increases, whatever rule you want to give it, just simply move closer towards the next one. And if you do that and you use the curving function for the um, whichever system you're using, uh, usually it's a Bezier, it'll just automatically do it. Your character will nicely follow the curve automatically because at the end of the day, it's just waypoints. It's just move from point to point to point. And so if you do that, it'll it'll kind of automatically work for you. So it's basically just points plus interpolation yeah this is uh exactly the article or the post to to you so i'll drop this in the chat and you can go check it out later go dig in or start using them they're really cool too just curves and splines in general they can be really handy and i think like you see it from outside it looks really daunting and confusing like this complicated complex thing eventually once you get familiar with it you spend it like a day with it and use it it becomes like oh yeah this is just another easy little tool to add to my tool belt that i wish i had known about before so <laughs> and there's there's so many things that you don't think about that it can help like there's a great course i think it's the mix and jam one or a great video where he's talking about building the uh the axe from god of war and you could just throw it you could just throw the axe and use velocity or use acceleration but it's going to literally go to the spot 
But if you put a curve in there where there's a second point somewhere up to the top right, it'll automatically do this sort of swish around the top point. And it just it feels really cool. And all you're doing is basically saying, rather than going straight to your destination, use this as an intermediary point and calculate a position around that one by using like a spherical lerp or something. And so the amount of code in difference it's usually only a few lines, but it gives you such a more powerful, controllable way of doing things, you know? Yeah, and just the extra little polish with just, an, again, a cool little trick like in your tool belt. Um, there's a question about using Ogre, the graphics library, for making a game. They used a bunch of other libraries like NVIDIA Physics and C++. Will that help them get experience in the professional world, and should they still use it? It will help if you're trying to get like an engine-level job working on the actual game engines for companies. A lot of game companies have their own custom in-house game engines that are built on C++. They're using uh, physics and they're using DirectX or OpenGL. And a lot of people use um, source versions of Unreal where they're customizing the Unreal engine. This won't help as much there, but it does help some because you still understand all of the fundamentals. You just don't have the Unreal specific knowledge there. Um, what I would recommend probably doing is if you're already doing this and you're doing C++ development is jumping over to doing some Unreal development, getting familiar with that, because it'll be much more likely to get you a position in actual uh, professional world because you could build uh, Unreal games and you could work on the C++ side of it. It's quite a bit easier than building something from scratch using Ogre, you know, building your own basically game engine on top of the, the graphics library. Um, and your experience here would actually directly relate and correlate to it. So I would say probably wouldn't keep it building with this. I would just switch to the latest Unreal or whatever version of Unreal you can and then start building on that and using your skills there and trying to trying to build up there. Yeah. I mean, being a developer for engines is still a very valuable and very well-paid skill. It's just not something that most game developers want to do. It's super specialized, yeah. It's the kind of thing where you'll find yourself writing the same kind of thing over and over, optimizing small details. Um, if that's a career you want, you can go down that road. But again, the truth is, most games these days are combinations of systems. If you play the new Spider-Man game, they didn't sit down and write a crowd system. They're using a, a third-party solution, and they're integrating with it. Similarly with all the other various different systems in a game, right? Like... Normally, games these days are compounding APIs and libraries from other people that you learn how to use and engage with. So, I would mm -hmm. say if you want to, if you want to work in a AAA studio, look at look at the little icons that show up at the bottom of a game and learn the technologies that have made those systems happen. You know. Oh yeah, and learn how to integrate those. Definitely. Oh, there was a super chat that popped in. I almost missed. Thank you, Jan. And it was, hey, Jasons, you're awesome together. Keep up your videos together. How about some refactoring together with one commenting on the other? That sounds fun. We'll have to do that. I think maybe we well, should I'm do a video that. sometime where we just build something together, refactor it, and talk about it. Um, maybe come up well, with well, a, a little bit. Um, Go ahead. One thing that myself and Charles used to do, people really loved, might be a good idea, is you have people post um, a GitHub link or something to a project, and then we pull it up on stream, and we can just sort of talk about it and what suggestions we'd have for the code base, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be fun, too. Maybe we can do that. Maybe we can start doing that, like, uh, next week or something. Like, do it as, like, a little mini segment. Just take a half hour and go through and look at look at a project or something. I guess, yeah, if, if you guys are interested in that, drop a mention in chat or a comment or something. Let me know. If there's enough people, you know, a couple people are interested, maybe I'll start reaching out. We can uh, we could do that. That would be fun. No. Or just shoot me an email with with your stuff, too. Let's see. So what else we got here? There were, I think, a bunch more questions. I just kind of was missing them. What communities would you suggest to join if you're interested in game dev? I know I've got a Discord server. Brackies has a Discord server. Uh, pretty much everybody has a Discord server. <laughs> like Charles has a Discord server. The, the truth um, is all of them. Just all of them. <laughs> yeah. Basically, every community you can join. I, I don't know. How many Discords am I in at the moment? Let me have a look here. Genuinely curious. Um I'm I'm in quite a few too. Um, I would also recommend that to maybe try getting um, not not just a, like an online chat community, but some sort of a meeting type thing. I really highly recommend going to like a local meetup or setting up a meetup with other developers that you're friends with and just meeting with them regularly and starting to form your own yeah. little social groups and 
and organizations too. I, a lot of people that I know who've become really successful in game development coming out of college and stuff were people who were doing exactly that. They were finding and creating little groups of their own, either finding groups and kind of getting into them and, and working with them or building up their own little communities of people. And it, yeah. you know, often just be classmates and friends, combination of them, and they slowly build up and get more and more people and it grows into mm-hmm. something. So I would find something like that, look online, look locally, find something where you're not just chatting asynchronously, but where you're also doing some I would say though, oh. here's my here's my hot take on that. Well, for starters, so the answer was 32. I'm in 32 Discord channels. That's how many I'm in. That's all. Obviously, yeah, obviously I don't communicate in all of them all the time, but there's at least 10 that I'm somewhat regular on. Mm-hmm. Um, but to, to say what you were saying earlier, I think one of the most, val- you're right, one of the most valuable things you can do is meet up with other people and just sort of like share knowledge. Um, but here's just a life tip for anybody who, especially in college-ish era, because you're, you're all going to be doing this yourself. You're going to be talking to your friends and going, guys, we should make a game studio. Wouldn't that be awesome? We should all just totally work together and make a game studio. And you're probably going to come up with that idea like four or five times and also never do anything about it with multiple different groups of friends. The reason why is that that's just really difficult. That's like dedication and work and resources. And to be completely honest, most people are not going to hold up with that. They'll get distracted or some people will do most of the work. Other people will be lazy and do nothing. So if you, if you meet up with the intention of working on one project together, it'll probably fall apart and you'll get nothing out of it. But if you meet up with the intention of just talking about topics you enjoy and hanging out, that is sustainable. There's no extra effort and work required in it. So if you if you want to really get value out of meeting other developers and other friends, make meetups where the point is show off the cool thing you learned this week or meet up and talk about AI stuff that's cool or maybe bring problems you have and other people will help you fix them. Don't make it a project you're all trying to work towards because that suddenly becomes a stressor and people won't do it. But if you want to just make a meetup, make a meetup that is about enjoyment of a hobby or interest. And that's something that will be easy to maintain. New people can join at any time because they don't feel like they have to take part in the project. And then you can just share and, and kind of get better at what you're doing. So if you are doing a meetup, don't make it a project, make it like a community. There's, there's a big difference. That's great advice. That's kind of what makes this easy too. Is like, if there's no, <laughs> I don't, I don't have, there's no work that has to be done. You just go in and have fun with it and talk about the the interesting things and not not have to stress too much. Because if this was again a thing where we had to go prepare for hours in advance and stuff, and uh, it wouldn't be nearly as easy to just be doing it and stay consistent and just constantly be here every week talking to everybody. So. I, I like that advice. And I've seen it happen all the time where everybody does that. They're like, oh, we're going to make a game. And, you know, one person makes the game and then just gets mad at everybody else that doesn't do anything because <laughs> everybody starts excited and interested. And, and then they realize how much work it is. And half the team decides they're not even really into game development anymore. They want to go be professional skiers or something. And <laughs> like, oh, OK, so, yeah, make a community. Have have fun with it. Don't just uh force yourself into trying to trying to build a project and be productive and release something build your own projects and share them if you want that's a much better way to do it. just build other stuff and talk about and share that stuff at the meetings if you want um so let's see there was one more question here i want to hit and then i don't know we'll see where we go so is it a good idea to publish a game that can be extended a lot in time and to add new features while it's on sale because I'm tired of implementing or changing stuff and want to publish it already. So it's a good question, right? I mean, it's kind of a mixed question because really the question is like, can I release my game now or do I need to push it, finish it? Um, it depends a lot on the game. Really, really, I mean, you want your game to be as good as it's going to get when you release it as like the actual published version, but you want to be putting it out there in front of people right away and as early as possible. So may, you might not be doing a full on like Steam published release early on or while you're still adding on features, but you definitely want to be getting it into the hands of players, people testing it and getting real feedback. Um, now, how much of it, I, for me, this depends a lot on like what you're actually going to do with it too. Because a lot of the time people 
publish a game, they have this idea that they're going to just keep building on it forever. And they realize that like they released the game. It's not very successful. It's not what they wanted to do. And the other features they really want to put into a different game instead. And they end up just kind of canceling it. Yeah. And, switching and, and see, that's, I, I think, again, I, I, I always go back to these very silly metaphors because I think that these questions are all basically the same thing. Imagine if instead of asking about a game, you were saying, I'm cooking my dinner. Can I stop cooking it yet or do I have to keep cooking it? It's like, well, does it taste good yet? Is it ready? Like, <laughs> that's basically <laughs> the question you're asking. Is If it's good, then you don't need anything else. There's two reasons why people will keep adding features. Either it's not fun, they, they're honest with themselves, they don't actually like it, and they're hoping if they just keep throwing features at it, it'll eventually be good. Or they're really enjoying it, it's so much fun, they want it to be as good as it possibly can, and they keep adding new stuff to it. And just like anything else, you can over-season food and make it bad, and you can also have it horribly needing a lot of seasoning, right? Like, it really comes down to what it is that you're doing. So the truth is, ask yourself, is it good? Like, do, do you actually enjoy it? If, if, you're, if you're exhausted of it, that's perfectly fine. You're kind of, you're allowed to be exhausted with your own project at the amount of time you've played in it. And sometimes it's very easy to forget what parts of your game are good or bad because you're seeing the same damn thing every day all the time. So you might need to refresh yourself. Find someone who's not played it and have them play it get their reaction, and then use that as a judging mark. Go, if they look like they're having fun, you're probably fine. If they look like they're kind of, oh yeah, that's nice, I see what you're going for, and then like put it down and don't actually want to play it anymore, you're like, uh-oh, okay, so maybe there's something to do here. So that's your answer. Find out if it's actually fun or not, and then use that as your metric. Now, and that's the best way to tell if, if the game is actually fun, too. Don't ask them, just look and see if they put the game down and keep playing. Don't listen to what they say because if you know them, they're going to lie to you and they're going to tell you that they liked it and it was fun and it's interesting and just needs a little bit of stuff. If they actually keep playing it and they don't put the controllers down, then it's fun. If they don't do that and they put the controllers back <laughs> down and they're just done playing it or they, they get up and they're like, okay, they switch over to Facebook or whatever other thing, it's not fun. Whether they told you it yeah. was a fun blast and they really want to play it, like, they stopped playing it, right? And it was a game. The, the version of that, play and they stopped playing it. The, the version of that, I think, is the biggest indicator for me. If you give somebody a game and they look really excited, and what they do is they take three steps forward and stop and go, oh, you should change that to this. And then go a bit forward. Oh, you should do this. You should. Wouldn't it be cool if that guy did this? You're like, they're not playing your game. They're making up one by walking through your game. And so the reason why they're doing that is because your game is so unengaging that their brain has so much free time to muse about the game they could be playing instead. So even if they look really enthusiastic, if they're playing through your game and just constantly giving advice rather than actually just playing the game, they're not enjoying the game they're actually playing. They, they're, they're guessing about some hypothetical game that might exist. Yeah, <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> I, I, I love that analogy, man. It's good stuff. Um, so I don't, did you have any tips to share this week? I know I jumped in with one in the middle. I don't know if you had brought anything. I think I'm running a bit low on tell. I mean, I know That's I have okay. a lot more. I just need to figure it out. I need to like prepare because I, I can come up with tips for days. I just need to actually sit down and pick an area, right? Like, cause it's, it's hard to remember what's been the most valuable to you as a person. Um, yeah. No, it's all I, good. I, I, I've been using Millinote for my tips. So I just like, when I grab something, I hit the yeah, little right. button that saves yeah. it off and I just save, oh, I go save that link. Oh, that goes under my tips. So well, my I new thing my, is the, my the, the tool I'm using called Obsidian. I've now replaced Evernote. I've replaced, um, uh, I used to use Nuclino. This new tool, Obsidian, has now replaced all of them. I've like, over overnight, I'm a convert. It's my brand new, all of my note-taking tool thing. So maybe that's a tip. That's been my new, it's based on Markdown, and you can effectively hyperlink between any number of pages. It's got tons of plugins for rendering everything from code to like, generating link style or, or um, SQL style queries in the middle of notes, which is crazy. There's all sorts of amazing tools. It's it's like my number one go-to note thing now. Interesting. So this is obsidian.md? That's the one, yeah. Right, let's just pull it up real quick and we'll share it. That looks interesting. I'll have to try this out. Yeah, it's got all the features that um, Nuclino had, which I, I really loved. But Nuclino is built around being a project management tool and they won't let you share your notes. This, what's really crazy cool about this, is it's a folder structure of markdown text files. There isn't like a third party database file. It is just a renderer that reads a directory of markdown files and then gives you all of the like hyperlinking, tooling, um, 
all of the like wiki style features for free out of that. So it's so easy to share. I literally have it pushed to GitHub. And what's really cool, I have a plugin for it, which automatically checks for changes and will commit itself to GitHub on a semi-regular basis if it notices changes. So it's my own personal wiki that's completely self-updating, full of plugins with graphs of all of the hyperlinks between elements. It's got a full graph database style system. Everything I need. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, it looks interesting. I'll have to check it out. Oh, and I don't know if they use it it's cool. not web based. It does, is it web based? Or no, it is. is. It's, it's Chromium. Yeah, it's Chromium. Well, it's not. It's not hosted on the web, but it's like okay. it's based on Chromium technology. So you can technically do web stuff if you want. Like what I use it for a lot is I actually put iframes in the middle of it, so I can actually host Unity projects and uh, links to like Twitter or YouTube videos, and I can embed them directly in these link notes, which is crazy. Oh, interesting. Try that. Once, once yeah, I've migrated I'll all of it. my notes, I'll, uh, I'll share it on stream one of these days. I'll show you like my entire, I have, I have a matrix of all of the ideas and thoughts and websites and bookmarks and all the YouTube links. And once I'm done with it, I'll, I'll kind of share it with, and I might even put it up on GitHub. We'll see. Let's see that map and see how it's all linked together. See inside the yeah. mind of Jason. Oh, actually someone makes a good question. Obsidian over Zettler. Zettler is another tool that does the same thing. I actually found Zettler first and Zettler is really cool. And I really love Zettler, but the problem is um, it doesn't have the plugin architecture that Obsidian does. A Zettler has all these really nice tools. It looks really nice. I actually prefer the interface in certain cases, but Obsidian is like, it's just so much more robust. There's so many things for hyperlinking that you just can't do in Zettler. And um, like, for, for example, there is um, the Git hooks thing the, um, that lets it automatically save itself. There is the ability to like make tables with sortable lists and orders and stuff on the table headers. Um, there's a whole load of integrations for like putting um, Jira notes and things dynamically embedded in the side of your notes. Like there's a ton and ton of features. A calendar. There's a calendar mode built in that lets you um, you can you can effectively mark notes by the day and use like as in kettle stands. Very, very, so there's so many. There's so many things about it that I just think make Obsidian better. Like I did try Zettler first, and it's it's good because it's open source. But like the fact that Obsidian is technically free, other than maybe if you want to support them, like you don't need to buy it. I did buy it because like within two days I was sold for life. I'm like this is this is what I've been looking for for like eight years as a tool, and now everything I've wanted to do it does. So it's just become my go-to now. Oh, nice. It looks like the paid thing is the syncing and publishing. Yeah, and I'll be honest. The syncing and publishing aren't great. Literally, you can set up your own GitHub and do your own syncing for free, and it doesn't bother it. But for me, I bought it as a supporting the engine because I immediately yeah. went, I'm on board. I'm going to use this for pretty much the rest of my life now. I want them to have as much money to make it better as possible. I don't even care about their feature set after that. It looks really cool. So I, I just want to see like your your actual built-up version of it. it. It'll take a while, but, it but, cool, but like, then I'll show you. Struggle. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, this is gonna be awesome. And then I put my stuff in there, and it's like three little blocks. I'm like, what do I want next? I get nothing. Well, when I, I was I was using it earlier, and I was able to kind of make make a thought about level design, and then it's like, oh, and I had my the, the person people who do good level design content. There's like Peter Fields. Peter Fields has three videos on the topic. Oh, this video is great. By the way, he references affordances. Affordances are up here, which references game design principles, which up here, which just goes into this whole big thing of like, for, for affordances, you want to color code things. If you want to go to color, go to color theory. Color theory talks about different kinds of color, and now you're talking about color wheels and whether you use them, you know, monochromatic color. It's like, and it goes into the whole thing. Like, you can just go down this rabbit hole. It's like a personal wiki of everything I've ever learned. And that's a uh, very that's very powerful because having all this stuff in your head and hard to reference is pretty tough. People often ask me for links to like those GDC talks. People are like, oh, which talk is that again? I'm like, I don't remember the link. I saw it like eight years ago on some GDC thing. And so finally being able to take my time and go back over all this stuff and actually have it there as links is going to be very useful. Yeah, I think that I, I just want to see it. <laughs> so there's a question about Game Maker. Have you used Game Maker lately? I haven't used it since Game Maker 1. Okay, it's, I think, been close to about that long for me. So they're just wondering, yeah, your thoughts on it. My thoughts are like, it seems like it always seemed like it was good for making very specific types of games. Like if you want to make a game that is like Game Maker is built for, which seemed like very much like we're great for like top down mm. um, 
um, RPGs. Who I'm thinking of, right? Like that was like the main thing that I've always pictured Game Maker as as building. I, I right? will say I used to feel that way. Game Maker One, especially, felt quite frankly like a level editor. It felt like a thing that lets you customize the base concept of kind of like RPG Maker, right? I felt like it fell yeah. in that category. That was how um, much how it felt to me. But by the time, oh, it's now it's it's completely changed. By the time I haven't used it, but I've seen people, I've seen what people do with it. Um, it's now fairly robust because people use it a lot for game jams and things. And there's now an insane wealth of features to, to, that are pretty powerful. It's kind of like, it feels like a halfway house to learning um, kind of the, the full coding of your own stuff in like Unity. Um, but like, I, I can definitely see value in it. I, I think though, the jump from getting really good at Game Maker to getting really good at Unreal or Unity is surprisingly small. So I think I would rather jump that way. Uh, but I, I do think that it's, it, it's certainly not a toy anymore. We'll put it that way. There was a point where it felt like a toy. Now it's a pretty legitimate engine. I just don't have need for it because I kind of feel like I've been using unity for so long. I would rather make most stuff myself, you know? Right. And I think I'm probably in the same boat. I had assumed that it was still kind of in that boat because I haven't used game maker in so long, but for me, it's kind of the same. It, it seemed like it did a lot of stuff, but I could just do most of those things in Unity, and the knowledge and skill would kind of translate a little bit better and had a little bit more flexibility. Um, it does seem like if you can build something in it, though, and one thing I would recommend is like if you can build something in it and you can get it done and publish it and release it, do that. Get that done. Don't yes. switch engines just because the other engine is better for the future or something else. Um, if if actually, the game can be done, get it done, I, and that I, I will would help even go. I'd even go one step further, and I would say, if your goal is to learn to make games and not to learn to code or learn, or you're not trying to make a single product, maybe you are better with Game Maker. Maybe because like you can do tons and tons of game jams really fast. Mm -hmm. Use like Pico Ace or Game Jam or Game Maker or any other tool you want. Um, another one is like P5JS. Use the canvas rendering stuff. Whatever you want, pick a really simple tool, but like. If you're using it for iterating ideas really fast, that's a perfectly valid and viable use for it. Yeah, just getting a game up and having up a portfolio piece, right? Having something that, that you can share that you've actually finished and completed. Definitely mm -hmm. better than just jumping over to something else. Um, yeah, cool. Oh, well, I don't know. Um, there are a couple more questions, but it's starting to get late, and I, I wanted to start getting prepared for the oh, yeah, we have the other thing to go to, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I got a. Q&A call in about 30 minutes. I think I set it for 1215 mm. for all the students. So you do a little bit of prep for that. I don't know if there were any other final questions you wanted to take, though. I want to give a little time and see if there's anything else in there you wanted to hit. Yeah, let's have a look. <sighs> and for everybody that's in the course, you should get an email. I'll send one out um, after this with the, the link to the thing. It's also just on the game architecture page that you'll be able to just get straight in there. Um, there's one question here about mastering the game engine or language versus building the game. I um, thought about popping that one up. I was kind of curious about what, what you were thinking on that. Go ahead. Um, well, I will say that I have probably, I regret it, but my previous advice used to be, I'm frustrated at the lack of basic sort of language tooling and knowledge that people have in Unity. Like there's so much stuff people don't know how to do with just like the syntactic sugar and how to like, there's tons of problems that people have in unity that aren't a unity problem. It's a fundamental misunderstanding of a language specific thing that if you learned how to do it would solve so many issues. So many issues with serialization boil down to people not understanding how, you know, the stack in the heap works or how particular elements are saved or how reference types versus value types work. And all of this stuff can be learned. It'll make everything else easier. That being said, to take my own advice, am I trying to paint a painting or buy a painting to decorate my office, right? And I think I, I've, I've come around to the idea that it's, I like the pride of learning the languages. I enjoy it. I think I enjoy it. It's fun to do. There's a lot of cool toys if you learn the language well. Um, but again, to tell the truth, if you're trying to make a game, just make a game. Just do the thing you want to make and everything else will come with it. You'll get better at the language over time. And if you decide you like the language more, Go learn how to make like a console application. You can now take half of that knowledge and apply it to another area. But I would I would focus on your actual goal. It's very easy to get distracted and feel like you can use the fact that you're not a genius at C sharp as a perfect excuse to never do anything for as long as you like. 
Or you can just make a thing and then come back to getting better at it over time. Yeah, I've, I've known a lot of people who just studied the fundamentals and never tried to build anything. And then they just forgot all the fundamentals because if you never use the stuff, it's like anything else, you tend to forget it. So it doesn't, it doesn't generally work well without just building it. And I, I like the advice. I really like your, your decorating and painting analogy. I'm going to start stealing that. Just use it every day. <laughs> it's, it's just great. It's, it's so just freaking accurate. So um, a little update on GML. So apparently it's it's helping uh, or getting back into C Sharp with a new Outlook. So I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. Like learning a basic language or, or a simpler language than C Sharp and then making the transition can be very handy. In fact, I think uh, the first language I learned was not C Sharp, C Sharp or C++. It was basic. Right? Like I learned basic on a Commodore. Mine was, mine was Visual Basic, so we're close. Yeah. <laughs> I was like basic and then I got a little bit of an intro to assembly and was like, this is really confusing. I don't know how people make games. This is the most confusing thing ever. Then Re- I saw what, what's a register and how does it apply to anything? Well, I'm well, like, so what, what, are, what are these three letter words and these numbers? That's all it was it's like, Hey, here's three letters and a number. I don't know what it is. is right. Yeah. Then C and then C plus plus. And they all were much easier because, I understood the basic, right? Like I understood the idea of a basic, a little bit of basic code with a go-to statement to so jump to a line, do a little bit of a branch and do a loop, right? Like that, that was enough. Once you get that down, I'm making the jump up to the other languages. I, I will say though, there's certain people who enjoy the like logicalness of it all. And it's fun to just build complicated systems. And that's enough to make, like I enjoy writing code where it does no visual component because it's satisfying to write even if it's kind of very unimpressive visually. And I thought, oh, that's fine. I can just do this forever. I don't mind. But I admit, every time I showed people two weeks of my excited learning on how to build like a graph tree structure or how to do my own, you know, quad tree efficient algorithms or whatever, it's like people are like, oh, cool. You have some boxes that are moving around the screen. It's like, no, you have no idea how smart the stuff is. It's like, And because of that, I, I kind of learned that there is a visual component to all of this. And there's a point where it is just satisfying have having the visual side work. And so I would say I used to give the advice to go aim in the language direction, but now I feel it's very easy to demotivate yourself to continue if you work on stuff that it's very hard to basically brag about. And a lot of programmers have the same problem where they can't build a resume because there's nothing to show off. Well, if you want to show off the stuff you do, you can show off like learning physics or learning maths, or you can build like a flying bird flock simulation. You get to do all the cool math stuff, and then you also get to have some cool birds flying around, right? So it's it's worth learning it and doing the visual side of stuff too. And so I, I would say that's kind of more the direction I would go. Rather than trying to learn the language inside out as a boring abstract concept, pick a slightly more complicated thing. Can you make a fluid simulation? Can you make um, you know, uh, soft body physics? Can you have like two bouncy characters bounce off each other? Like, can you pick something silly, but that is also mathematically complex, like inverse kinematics, and then make something out of it? Can you make a spider character that climbs up a wall that'll give you something visual to show off as well as teach you the complicated stuff? I think that's it's much better advice. And it's just easier to get it done because you see it and you have something to share and show. And that's one of the reasons I like game development too. I always tell people like, I like game development over enterprise stuff because I can show people what I'm doing and they smile. Like, And people like get happy and care. When I work on enterprise stuff, people only care if they're mad. <laughs> like, well, 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 that's why with like, UI stuff, like I've gotten really into like time. shiny UIs. Even yeah. for enterprise, I've gotten used to like if I'm gonna if I'm making little internal enterprise apps, I'll always put like a little animated thing on stuff just to just because it's one of those things that it, it elevates everything if it's like a little swishy or a little bit nice, you know. Yeah, it's you can add a little bit of polish and niceness, but for most people, like yeah, they're nice, using yeah. that to do a job, and like it's just a tool. It's like a hammer to them, and like you can make the coolest fucking hammer in the world, and they really <laughs> don't care, like. All this true. hammer saves us like one hit per per nail or you know ten cents per nail. Like, not my money; it's the business's money. <laughs> like, but with the games, like yeah, everybody sees it and everything you do, they they interact with the play, and you can show it to people and they can relate. Like you can show it to any random person that you know, and they can relate. Where you show somebody your web service, and unless they're a developer who builds web services, they have no idea what they're even looking at. <laughs> 
See, that, that's why my favorite thing right now is level design. Like, it's my current hobby to learn. Um, like, I love sound design stuff. I love programming, all that, whatever. But level design is the area where you're literally trying to give people a certain experience. The whole point of level design is to almost, like, walk that line, is actually navigate and direct how they feel about the space they're in. And it's really exciting doing that because it's really fun to look at it and go, I can I can specifically come up with the idea. I want people to walk into this room, be confused, go, aha, and then do something. And I can like structure it such that they have that exact cycle of emotions. And it's really cool. So I think level design is one of those areas that's that gives you just what you're describing. You you can give people that sort of feeling of a of an emotional journey through something that no amount of buttons on an enterprise form is going to do. <laughs> so not even the best like checkout workflow or <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> all right cool well thanks um i think we'll probably wrap it up here with that one that was, that was good stuff i want to say thanks everybody for coming out uh we're gonna jump over to the q a call for students in just a little bit yeah. um if you're in there just check the architecture course page i, I think it's my turn it's my turn to say like and subscribe so you know all of that yeah. stuff oh. Yes, and definitely <laughs> hit like and subscribe. And also down below, there's a button to donate to Jason's coffee fund. I'm going to go donate after this. Um, everybody else, I would recommend it as well. It's that way low, he's highly low. energized and uh, wants to keep talking, <laughs> talking about coffee and code. That's his name, just coffee and code. Yeah. Get a little <laughs> mug. My wife watches um, this Stephanie Harlow lady on youtube she does a coffee and crime thing it's reminding me of it she sits there cool. bug and just talking about whatever the latest um true crime stories she's all into true crime and she loves watching that stuff so it's a uh, interesting we'll have coffee and code sometime maybe maybe that could be um when we when we dive into other people's code and their projects yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Drink coffee and talk about <laughs> talk about the code all right um thanks again everybody for coming out thanks jason for being here don't forget to like subscribe drop a comment down below after the stream's over and just say hello or let us know what other stuff you want to do or that you just liked it and you want youtube to like it as well and um don't forget to share on facebook and whatever other places you got all right thanks again everybody and i guess we'll uh see you next time bye let me find the button to to go away now and then we'll disappear into a blob of colors. <laughs>